I'm Kiki Palmer. I'm Common. Welcome to Bear Witness, Take Action, the third in a series of specials committed to elevating and enhancing the voices and stories of black creators. The first Bear Witness, Take Action streamed on YouTube in June 2020. It featured a coalition of activists and actors, community leaders, and creators joining together to lend their powerful voices to a conversation about inequality and systemic racism in America. A few months later, YouTube launched Bear Witness, Take Action 2. Its mission was to continue the movement, to raise awareness, and once again, to act to bring about real change. And now, we're bringing you the third in this series. Bear Witness Take Action 3 will focus on the issues facing our people and the challenges that affect each and every one of us as individuals and as a community. And for the voices and stories that are at the heart of Bear Witness Take Action 3 will be much more personal. A collection of six videos. Each one is a creative vision from a unique YouTube creator in their own voice and style. The episodes these creators have produced will live on their YouTube channels, and you'll be able to see all their episodes in this one compilation. Now, after each episode, Kiki and I will sit down with each creator to learn about their motivation and inspirations and to explore what led them to the creation of their content. Our featured creators on Bear Witness Take Action 3 are Evan Rayner, Josh Slade, Justin James, Asia Jackson, Teddy Ray, and Smino and Ashley Acuna with Donovan Thompson. Among the topics featured are mental health, the challenges of being gay, black, and HIV positive, what one would do if one ruled the world, and a variety of other subjects related to black culture. Plus, there are animated superheroes in a piece voiced by Sterling K. Brown, and episodes that feature, among other prominent figures, award-winning singer Tanache and an NAACP Image Award-nominated star of Dear White People, Logan Browning. Bottom line, this is going to be a joyful celebration of excellence and unique voices. And Common and I are so excited to share all these amazing talents with you. Now, I'm really excited to be back in person for the first time with Kiki. Oh, right yeah. back at you, Common. Yeah. And now, it's time to begin with our first episode. Yeah. This episode grew out of the day-to-day -day back and forth that the co-hosts of YouTube show and channel, The Grapevine, we're having about how to inspire people to take real action to change the world. It led Ashley and Donovan to the idea of using familiar faces to bring attention to causes that truly matter. Their creation showcases celebrities who may already have their own platforms, but who welcome the opportunity to talk about their personal messages in a way that can help others. And they accomplished this by asking a provocative question. Take a look at their conversation with Logan Browning about mental health on this episode of If I Ruled the World. What if you could rule the world? What would you change? What would it look like? The Grapevine has always been about having honest, hard conversations. But now we are going beyond the table and asking some of our favorite people to imagine a world where they make the rules. Same real conversation, but with a little more imagination. First up, access to mental health care featuring Dear White People actress and licensed meditation instructor, Logan Browning. She'll take us through her meditative world of healing on this week's If I Ruled the World. Welcome to If I Ruled the World. I'm Ashley Acuna, and alongside my co-host Donovan Thompson, we want to talk to bring something very serious to your attention. Just how much ghetto Earth is. Girl, Earth is so ghetto. Earth is ghetto. I want to leave. I'm out here doing the hood Olympics with no life insurance in the hood. We were in the trenches. But seriously, y'all, we are still dealing with a global pandemic, a rise in climate change disasters, a massive spike in homelessness, and a country that is divided more now than ever. And that's just the last three years. 
And although things may seem hopeless, if we talk it out, we can find some new solutions to some old problems. But before we heal the world, we have to heal ourselves. And our guest today is none other than the queen of self-care, the mistress of mindfulness, the meditation mommy herself, Miss Logan Browning. Oh, well, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our paradise. Do you I see what's going it. on here? Yes. yes. I know it's pretty in here, but it's pretty shitty outside. And that's yes. what I want to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. This last year has been absolutely insane. Actually, the last three years have been pretty insane. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're trying to do now is move forward with our lives. So how have you been coping with this new world we're living in? I mean, we all experienced a collective trauma, yeah. if we're gonna yeah. be honest, yeah, definitely. Um, on a lot of levels, um, from the, the actual like virus and how that took hold across the world, specifically in black and brown communities. Yeah. Right. Uh, there was another pandemic, I don't know if you heard, it's called racism. Yeah. Um, that <laughs> I've happened. Heard of it. Yeah. It's been around for a while. It has. No so vaccine for that though. No vaccine, yeah. apparently not. So all of those things, like especially for black and brown people, it, it, it's a trauma. I mean, it's, it's literally creating it within our systems, like this fight or flight response right. that we then have to re have a response to, which causes anxiety, which causes depression, which causes all of those things. Yes. And so for yourself, when did you first realize that you wanted to experience better mental health? When I was like maybe 13, 14. Wow. It's early. Being a young person, I definitely felt the need for some sort of assistance. I found my safe space in like reading scriptures and things like yeah. that, which I do think laid a foundation for, for me you, yeah. in terms of e even exploring meditation and mindfulness yeah. right. in, down the line. Right. Yeah, for sure. And so for you, you mentioned meditation. What was your road to meditation like? How did you um, get there? I took 75 South and got off on Peachtree. <laughs> um, Let me write this down. <laughs> <laughs> when I was doing, actually hit the floor. I was okay. doing mm -hmm. hit the floor and so I was trying to get really flexible. Thank you. <laughs> I was trying to get really flexible, so I was going to hot yoga. Mm -hmm. And at the end of hot yoga, you're laying down in what's called shavasana. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really like the start, the beginning of that meditative process, because right. you've like loosened up your body, you've connected mind, body, and spirit. And I found that really fascinating that I had a moment of quiet and still. My, I felt my heart racing. I felt like in wow. my body. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, from there, went and started trying meditation. I really had no understanding of it and um where i tried meditation for the first couple of times i realized uh i realized that i could access it mm -hmm. it reminded me of it reminded me of when i thought shakespeare was inaccessible for me as like a young oh, black girl and then okay. i accessed it and i was like there's something here for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh yeah i i was like wow i this this is way more accessible right. than anyone ever showed me or pointed right. me in the direction of. And then I did a meditation teacher training because I wanted other people to have that. I, I didn't want other people to have to, you know, pay the money that I did to go study right. where I studied. I just want to take the tools and the resources and connect them to people who need them. Yeah. Because um, we're all capable of, we are all, we are all teachers, we are all students, we are all learning from each other. Right. Um, and so that's kind of where, that was my road to meditation and, and I'm still on it, you know, it's mm -hmm. a path and I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna stop walking down that path. Definitely. Yeah, and that's a really great point because it's a process and I think that's what people have to understand about meditation. It's not like a one time you sit down and all right. of a sudden you're like, oh, my last name is Gandhi now. Like, <laughs> that's not how it works. It's a huge misconception, but there's so much value in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I hope that people really decide to try that. But I feel like when it comes to mindfulness, when it comes to mental health, the thing that really matters to me is that it's equitable, that everyone has the access. Like for right. so long, it's like, you have to be skinny white wearing yoga pants in LA to access yeah. these kinds of things that are really beneficial. And the communities that need it the most aren't getting it. Let's talk about you, you it. See, and that's the thing because black people, when you're struggling and you're trying to just like be okay and mm -hmm. not get killed or provide for your family or you're just trying to get to the next day, you're not thinking about, oh, let me take a minute and meditate. It's just not yeah. something yeah. that a lot of people in the hood are, are thinking about. But one of the things like in your specific industry, right? Like working in a place that reveres your beauty and reveres your hard work and showing up and showing out, how were you able to like continue to find purpose in it and continue to be like an activist or an advocate while you're doing your work? I think for me, I am starting to walk down a path 
that is allowing my purpose to not be so linear, mm -hmm. to not be so um, defined by the world that we live in, but be defined by the fact that I, my purpose is to be here. My purpose is to exist. My purpose mm -hmm. is to be curious, to experience. And at that, I can continue to live my life. And I also think as creatives, you know, a lot of times, I think for me specifically, it's tunnel vision, right? Mm -hmm. Like the goal, get this thing, get this money, get this award, get this. And then when you reach it, a lot of times it can be empty. Mm -hmm. Or like us, you know, we had a really great friend to the show, Aisha K. Faines, who passed away. And I'm so sorry. Thank you. And, you know, when you when something like that happens, it shocks you and you realize, OK, I didn't have time to meet with this person because I was working. I didn't do this because I was working. And then all of a sudden you're thrown out of the tunnel and you're like, do you want your life to just be this tunnel vision? Is that enough? And who are you forgetting about in the process when you do that? Let's take a moment with this because yeah. you just shared something that is very real to you. Yeah. And very Im mm -hmm. important. And, and I want us to be present with that because you're not the only people who are experiencing that. Yeah because it's not about what we're doing here. It's not about what we're filming here. Right. It's about what we're experiencing. It's about the quality of our lives. Right. There's something called RAIN. Yeah. It's an acronym. The word is recognize. Recognize where in your body you're feeling that emotion. Yeah. Recognize what is that? How does, it, how does it feel? How is it showing up for you? The A is allowing it. Right. Mm -hmm. Allow that to be here. You don't have to fight it. You yeah. know, who says that we can't be crying on this thing? Right. Who says that we can't right. need a moment, right. you know? investigate, investigate where, where that's showing up for you, investigate like how, how, how does the emotion feel? And knowing that every other person is feeling something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how we make the world more compassionate. Yes. We Definitely. can notice, you know, notice that in someone else. It, we're talking about mental health and I think you both are in a very authentic space when it comes to mental health and wellness, which is just being honest with those feelings because what is life if we're not if we're not honest if we're not honest exactly so it's just when you say that and that liberation i hope people really get that because that's a huge part of like releasing some of the expectations of society and start to define those things for yourself so logan if you ruled the world what would it look like if i ruled the world you know, I don't even know if I would really rule it at all. I, I don't want some control over it. I well, want... um, for the purposes of branding, you know. Okay, so if I ruled the world, everything would slow down so that we could actually see how connected we all are. We would be able to walk around and pass someone on the street and then their actual heart, like their chest just opens and reveals this mirror and it would show us who they are and like what they're dealing with, being able to connect via that shared experience. Let's see, what else? Okay, let's just start at the very beginning. Us as children, right? In my world, we wouldn't punish children for having emotional responses to their circumstances. They wouldn't be forced into a box figuratively or literally like detention, making them face walls and sit in cold rooms. That would be replaced with allowing them to reflect on their emotions, to be present with how they're feeling. And speaking of walls, my world wouldn't have any. Wait, no walls? And we're still in America? Okay, imagine a neighborhood, and in this neighborhood, you're able to trade and share food and clothes, mentorship, babysitting, and play together, explore together. I mean, an actual community being a community. And let's keep it real. In any world, chaos is inevitable. My world wouldn't ignore the true complexities of life. How would you work against that? Well, you don't work against it. You work with it. Practice present moment awareness and acceptance and have incredible access to tools that support that kind of living.
So present moment awareness, for example, is everyday chore or task or just anything you might do on autopilot. Washing the dishes, for example, you could take a moment to listen to the water as you pour it into the sink. Notice that satisfaction of going from dirty to clean to feel abundant with what you have instead of leaning into what you don't. In my world, acceptance would feel like, uh, imagine, okay, this woman is in this boat in the middle of the ocean by herself and the boat is sinking and she has a bucket. Don't ask me how she got a bucket. She just has a bucket and she's like fighting tragically to scoop this water out of her boat. Uh, if you fight against it, you sink. Exactly. She's in complete panic and, and she's struggling to keep this boat from sinking, which is the inevitable. This boat has this crack, like it's going down. Hashtag Titanic. But in my world, what acceptance looks looks like is her realizing what's happening, taking a moment to pause, relax, and have this gentle acceptance where she stops fighting. And as the boat goes away, she then is saved by her own acceptance in the form of a big, beautiful fish that's just gonna come out of the water and carry her off into the sunset. <laughs> and then access. The most important part of my world is having the access to the things you need. That would be like going to a store. The storefront doesn't have any advertising, capitalistic or societal pressures telling you what the world thinks that you need. And then being able to receive it without barrier to entry, right? Like finances, geographics, race, gender, class, creed, none of those things get in the way. It's you actually having the ability to ask for what it is that you want and what you need. If I ruled the world, it would be a place where anyone could enjoy a happy, healthy, beautiful life. Wow, what an awesome journey you just took us on. I want to bring in a friend of ours to help everyday folks make it a reality. Thank you, Dr. Muriel, for joining us. So tell us a bit about what you do. Yeah, thank you for having me. So I am a holistic psychologist and mm -hmm. I'm licensed in New York. So basically what I do is that I conduct therapy, right? But from the perspective of mind, body, and spirit, so really getting at the soul of who the person is mm -hmm. and being able to extract the layers of trauma that they've experienced from different perspectives from the area of the mind, which is thoughts and emotions, the body, which is really kind of somatically how we capture a lot of our trauma. And then also from the spirit, how connected they are, how relational they have been, or how much disruption has occurred within the, that space of their world. So yeah. holistic psychology is what I do. I love that. So, so, cool. so diving into Logan's utopia. You mentioned um, kids and I think back to high school and middle school and I was very angry. <laughs> Definitely had a lot of girls in headlocks. A little bit of stress, a little bit of stress. <laughs> I did, I fought a little bit. Um, and so I think about, you know, what would be the difference if in schools we taught people, kids meditation and maybe even for teachers as well? I mean, imagine a world where you don't have detention. Mm -hmm. If you're acting out, if you're lashing out, instead of going into a room and sitting into, I mean, and I definitely, I definitely was there. So <laughs> I know what it looks like. Right, right. I know what it's like. And a lot of those kids who do go to detention, a lot of those kids who do get in trouble or, you know, this, uh, uh, suspended, mm -hmm. expelled, they are black and they are brown kids because no one wants to give the time and the resources or the empathy Mm -hmm. to help those kids through that process. And I think that that's a huge part of it too, is that when we talk about the injustices, when we talk about the pandemic of racism, that's one of the earliest places that people knock black and brown folks off of their feet. By saying that who you are and the way that you show up, even with your emotion and your feelings makes you wrong. And when you don't have the language, when you don't have the agency to really understand, how do you compartmentalize these feelings? You wanna just do it again, cause I got attention the last time. It's true. Okay. I'll do it again because I got the attention the last true. time. You are going into epigenetics and generational trauma now. Uh, we, we may need like 10 episodes on <laughs> <laughs> generational trauma. Um, but, you know, there, right now, we have so many people that are embodying in their mind, in their body, and in their spirit a lot of generational pain from their lineage, right? And so the unfortunate piece about intergenerational trauma is that it then transcends into the next generation and we just keep it going. So we keep it going genetically. So y'all have already like spoken about epigenetics. So there are genetic mutations and expressions that are transferred over into the next generation, but there's also modeling, like the way that 
perhaps I, if I were a parent, if I'm showing up a certain way in my home, if I'm showing up from the perspective of a trauma response, and I'm always in that space, in that headspace, and I'm passing that on by way of how I'm acting in my home, my children are picking up those behaviors and then they're mimicking those behaviors forward. From the people within their families, their communities that have not had the opportunity to actually extract those wounds from themselves, either because they don't have or have not had privilege and access to someone like myself, a therapist, or to tools, right, to knowledge about how you can extract emotional wounds from who you are. A lot of us don't really think that things like therapy and meditation are accessible. How can we change that? A lot of the work that needs to be done in order to change the access that we have has to be from the perspective of policy, right? Like, okay. we, we actually have to extract the barriers that are existing. The ways that therapy is so expensive because it's not reimbursed in the, in the ways that you're going to just, you know, you, stubbed the toe and now, you know, it's bleeding and it's like, you get coverage for that in a very different way than you get coverage for therapy. You may get like 20% covered and then that $200 fee then has to come out of somewhere on a weekly basis. And if you think about your day-to-day -day North American person, they're not gonna be able to afford that, right? And especially within our communities where racism is intertwined with economics, like we have a lot of people that are in poverty in our communities and are not able to access therapy and are especially not able to access individuals that look like me, right? But then also like, you know, I take it to social media to spread some information about mental health because I'm like, if we can't gain access here, this feels like a lot and it's not really going anywhere right now, then let's do something here in this space. You know what the irony is? is that if everybody got to go to therapy, it literally would make everything better. Like corporations, they would be doing better. You know what I'm saying? Families would be doing better. But it seems as though for people, it's a, it's a privilege and it shouldn't be given towards, you know, to everyone. I know for me, I'm pretty much what you just described. Like I have been on a waiting list for therapy for like about five months. Yeah. But then also it's because there are not enough therapists to help everybody. Yeah. I think my first um, appointment is gonna be in December. Can you imagine if I was wow. dealing with a crisis, I was like, good luck, brother, you can wait until December. Right. And it's not even guaranteed because it's a waiting list. So how do you feel about the idea like therapy can help the individual, but how does it help the broader world? We can't leave out, you know, the fact that the ways that we have traditionally done therapy, either in an organizational way or in an individual way, it, it just doesn't serve our people, right? Like, so we have to reconfigure the traditional, like, structure of therapy to make it fit for us and to, right. to make our people better and well, right? But there are ways that we can actually globalize therapy. Mm -hmm. There, there is the lack of access, but there's also the lack of um, like cultural awareness that this is available to us and that it will help us. It's like, you know, we'll go spend however much money on skincare, perfume, clothes, but for some reason, if you do have that, that access to those funds, you can't even, it would never occur to you to spend it on your mental health. Yeah. That's so true. So Dr. Marielle, for people like me who don't have access to therapy right now, what can I do, what can other people do to like set ourselves on the pathway to better self-care? The one thing that I would say that anybody can do in this very moment is to set a routine, a ritual of at least five minutes at the top of your day before everything else happens because you want to start from a foundation of wellness at the top of your day and do something for five minutes that's meditative, that's mindfulness oriented, breath work, journaling, anything that can actually like centralize your thoughts and make you feel grounded in mind, body and spirit. What would you say for someone like, say the day hits you, right? That you, yeah. It becomes 2 p.m. and the day has hit that's you. Real. Like mm -hmm. what tools would you have for someone at that point? My favorite tool for a middle of the day break is progressive muscle relaxation, where you literally like, yes. Don't know what this is, so what is this? So dope, it's so dope. You just, you take each muscle group from your head down to your toes and you tense each of the muscle groups and then you release them with an out breath. So you inhale in and release and it releases the tension, the actual stress that's deposited into your body. It actually starts releasing it momentarily. Like, in that moment and thereafter, you're actually gonna feel greater ease and it's a great way to actually break into your day, get yourself into relaxation mode and then transition into the rest of your day. That's awesome. Wow. I'm definitely mm -hmm. gonna try that. That was a great point to end on. Thank you so much, Dr. Mario. Thank you. Thank you again, Logan. You both were amazing. You're amazing.
He's here, yeah. And for you all at home, thank you for joining us for this discussion. Please check out the description box right below so you can get access to the information and resources that we talked about in today's video. Please like, subscribe, share, and join us next time. Until then, peace out. Bye. 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 <laughs> the grapevine began almost seven years ago as a vehicle for Ashley Acuna to respond to the negative stereotypes and bad rap the millennial generation was getting. Ashley invited her colleague Donovan Thompson on as a guest panelist, but he ultimately became her co-host and business partner. Together, they have always been focused on promoting honest, open and important conversations. And they are both here with us today. <laughs> What's up? Uh, so nice guys? I've seen what you guys have been doing with the grapevine, so it's good to get a chance to sit down and talk with you guys. Now, Ashley, you did an episode where mm -hmm. people chimed in and they would, you know, talk about what they would change if they ruled the world. Yeah. What made you choose that topic? I was in elementary school when Columbine happened, and I'm 33 now, and, like, school shootings are still happening. Throughout my life, I've always had a deep passion for things that are going on. And, um, you know, we're in a time where there's a lot of divisiveness, there's a lot of darkness, and we need some hope. And I think it's my life mission to make my work um, healing work, work that helps people think, work that um, puts light back into the world because we need it. So that was my I, idea with this show. Our imagination and what we see in the world is so important. So yeah. I love that. And, uh, you know, Donovan, for you, like, what does a perfect world look like for you? Oh, so you're gonna flip it on me. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. You know what, for me, I am really big on empathy. I think empathy is the thing that's the game changer. So we gotta put some things on the chopping block. So white supremacy got to go. Um, yeah. Capitalism, I don't really like her too much, so she may have to go. Yeah. And I think, like, one of the things that I would implement, for example, is, like, therapy for all. You know, as a gay black man, I want to be able to live my life. Yes. I just want to be me, you yeah. know what I'm saying? I don't want anyone to interfere with what I'm doing. I just want to be loved and I want to give love. I think if we didn't have to worry about racism, uh-huh, yeah. and people telling us what we can't have all of the time, yeah. if we had access to those types of things, and more so than anything, if we didn't use money as the biggest indicator of success, of happiness, of joy, we would have all a better life. So I would want to see that eradicate it. So, Ashley, I'm going to also throw it back at you. <laughs> what would your perfect world look like? For me, having the tenant of do no harm, my family alone, like, in the group chat, we're all disagreeing about everything. So, globally, we can't agree on everything, right? Right. But if we had the tenant of do no harm, I think, like, we would get through a lot of stuff. And I really want to know what, overall, would you all want people to, to take away from, from episodes you do and just this episode and everything you do. I want people to dare to, like, live in a different world, to, like, dare to dream of a different society. And I just want people to see this episode and just open their hearts and just have care for each other yeah. and realize we can live in a better world. Maybe not a utopia, but a world where kids don't have to die when they go to, go to school. And the thing is, is like, Logan was amazing. She was yeah. We had tears, we laughed, we did everything. But one of the things that, that I took away from it was that she does have a big platform. She is a major celebrity. We all have seen Dear White People. She's awesome. Yeah. And she's allowing people into her world and, and, and understanding, listen, she had to run to meditation because for, that's for her own mental health. Yeah. And what are we doing for hours? Man, I could go on and on with you two. The work that you're doing, I really appreciate it. We need yeah. more love, more happiness, more inspiration. Yeah. So I re really appreciate you guys. <laughs> really? Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for joining yeah. us. Of course. Cultural appropriation is not a term we may have heard a lot growing up, but it's now one that is constantly in the public dialogue. And the debate over what is cultural appreciation versus appropriation is one that is fought on social media, on talk shows, and podcasts. Actor, activist, and content creator Asia Jackson conceived our next episode to open up a real conversation about this issue with the goal of raising our awareness of all the nuances involved when one group's culture influences popular culture. What's good? I'm Asia Jackson, and I'm a Black and Indigenous Filipino actress and content creator. And this is Tracing the Trend, where we trace the origins of today's most popular trends and examine how they've shaped our society. Cultures influence one another all the time, and that exchange can be a great thing. It can help ideas grow and change, bring people together, and strengthen communities. But there's always a risk that adaptation can turn into appropriation. 
where cultures become exploited and the creators behind them get overlooked or ignored. On today's episode, we'll be exploring this topic through an example that's near and dear to my heart, the influence of hip hop within Asian communities. Growing up as a military brat, I've lived in many different neighborhoods and countries, ranging from mostly Asian to predominantly Black. As a result, I found myself identifying with both cultures. This was especially the case ever since I moved to good old Long Beach. It was so cool to see, you know, African Americans supporting Asian American rappers in a way which proved to me that cross-cultural exchange can be a positive one. Unfortunately, some of the discourse I've witnessed online between both Black and Asian communities has been a different story, but I truly believe that an open discussion can help foster growth. So today we're tracing the trend of hip hop culture's influence on Asian youth with three rock stars. Lending her POV as the first Asian woman in hip hop Sophia Chang tore through the music industry, managing some of the biggest names like RZA and Old Dirty Bastard of the Wu-Tang Clan. Emerging as the latest artist out of the Bay Area to put Asian American rappers on the map, my friend GuapDev4000 is here to talk about how his Black and Filipino upbringing has affected him personally and professionally. Danielle Smith has an impressive pedigree that includes being the first African-American editor of Billboard magazine and the first female editor of Vibe magazine. With a career immersed in hip hop music and culture, Danielle brings her expertise and insight into hip hop's global influence. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to have everyone here for this conversation. Um, I'm black and Asian, so I've always been interested in exploring this conversation mm -hmm. and what a wonderful group of people to have this conversation with. So thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Yeah, absolutely. So, it's lovely to be in a <laughs> Yeah. I want to show you guys a music video from a Cam Cambodian American rapper from Long Beach. His name is Stupid Young. Let's roll. Ask about me in the streets, I'm a East rep. Home with Snoop Dogg and DPG, but we next. Uh, that's the city by the sea. So, Stupid Young has come uh, under some controversy because he is an Asian rapper and he is, you know, making music videos like this, um, particularly from people who aren't from Long Beach. I'm from the east side of Long Beach, so this is something that I'm very familiar with. Um, but I just wanted to, like, get your guys' opinion. Like, what do you think of an Asian rapper? What do you think of the style of music that he's making? People have an issue because an Asian is rapping? Basically, yeah. They, they have a problem with him, like, just the, the way that he's acting, like his demeanor. These are my markers for cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. It's D-E-E. -E. Denigration, exploitation, and erasure. If the blanket question to me is, should Asians be able to rap? Yeah, I don't know any, like, nobody that I worked with. There is no way that guys in Wu-Tang would be like, oh, Asians can't rap. Mm -hmm. It's such a preposterous notion. I think anybody who engages in hip hop who is not black or brown has to acknowledge that and acknowledge your privilege, right? I was welcomed into hip hop. I was embraced by hip hop in 1987. That was a privilege. It's not my culture. I didn't make it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not my folks. It's not my history. But they took me and like, oh, so come over here. And that was a privilege, mm -hmm. and, I, and I understood that. That's the part that's important to me. Now, Stupid Young isn't the only Asian American rapper who's been grabbing attention. There's so many others from different parts of the world who have also fallen in love with hip hop. But when you think about its rich history, what's not to love about it? Black people have always utilized music as an avenue of communication, social commentary, and expression. For hundreds of years in West Africa, history was told through stories and gossip. The roots of rapping began with storytellers using rhyming as a way to remember and repeat these tales. Fast forward to the 20th century, Bronx, New York, where black music, storytelling, and rapping evolved into what would eventually become not only one of the world's most popular music genres, but also a profoundly important cultural movement, influencing those worlds away from the NYC block parties from which it originated. 
What began as local black and brown street culture has been embraced by people all around the world. But what's the line between respectful borrowing versus blatant exploitation? I think the thing for me is erasure. Hip hop is so massive. It impacts culture so much. It impacts global culture so much. There's no way it's not going to have an effect on, on everybody. But the problem comes in is when black people are erased from that. When artists come in and act like there was no part of blackness in this, I'm just me and I'm just doing it. Even in this short bit that we saw, he said, Snoop Dogg is from here and we're next. And immediately I was like, oh, okay, cool, he gets it. I feel like that's the authenticity that we look for. And I do know this man, I'm friends with him. Um, and I could say that it's very authentic all the way. And that's why it's even hard to pick at it because it's him. That's how he lived. That's mm -hmm. good to know. Actually, Cambodian Americans, most of them came to this country as refugees, refugees. Yeah. during the Cambodian genocide, you know? Yeah. Uh, the leader there killed, you know, almost a quarter of the population. They all had to migrate here. And when they got here, they often lived and moved into, you know, low-income communities like East Side Long Beach, and there were already established street gangs there. So they just had to assimilate. I think that's a part that a lot of people don't recognize about the Asian American experience is that when you come here, there's like one or the other that you have to assimilate to. And I feel like that's not talked about enough. I went to the streets of Long Beach and we talked to some kids over there to get their opinion. We talked to some teenagers, we talked to some people my age and we're just gonna take a look at it and get your reactions. Gray clouds and some palm trees. Bad bitches and bikinis blowing bomb weed. I'm a soldier and my hood is in Long Beach. On me, West Coast, California bound. Do you think that not like an Asian person can make rap music? Of course, yeah. anybody can make music. Okay, anybody can yeah. make rap music because it really depends on where you come from and what you're saying. Stupid Young is from Long Beach mm -hmm. and he grew up in the community with black people and black culture. Right. So I do think it's different for him. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's a problem if they're rapping about things that they grew up with no. instead of like rapping about growing up in a rough neighborhood? Rap isn't just for one culture, right. it's for everybody okay. as long as it's authentic. Right. Do you think that there are certain artists that are from those cultures that perhaps don't have that understanding of hip hop That's, or, yeah. Yes, of course, I mean, of course, there's gonna be. Do you think it's because of a language barrier? So really what we're fighting on the larger scale is ignorance, mm -hmm. right? Because we don't even have the opportunity to learn um, about each other's cultures, right? So everything sort of seems like it's, you're taking from somebody else. Right. In the American context, <laughs> we are built on appropriation, yeah. right? So pe people's norm is to just take. Yeah. And, and, and also there's appreciation. There's two levels of appreciation, right? There's surface level appreciation and then you take it, but you still appreciate, mm -hmm. but you don't include any black people. That's different than appreciating that culture, uh, including in what you do, and then also appreciating the people that go along with it. Yeah. So you think it's totally different that stupid young is who he is versus an Asian person that's from Orange County that didn't grow up in the hood. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah because he's being himself, he's not putting on an act. It's the difference between appropriation and cultural appreciation. So like, oh, see, see, the teens do know right? what's up. The teens, the teens know, what's, know what's, what's good. good. <laughs> None of them talked about him being Asian until they were prompted. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. None of them said, "Wait." When I showed this video, no one was phased at all. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't even be. If I didn't even know him, I would watch it and listen to the song. Yeah. More than I would care about his race. That kind of be a pat on my back just as a, another Asian dude. Like, oh, that's tight, but I probably wouldn't even speak on it. Yeah. I'm interested. Like, I want to know more. Mm. Like, I'm looking, I'm like, you know, reminding me about the Cambodian, you know, refugee experience in Southern California. Mm. Yeah. yeah, like, I want to know. If that's who he is and that's how he wants to be, he's not acting like there was nobody in the LBC 
before me. Before me. Right, right. Yeah. So another topic that I wanted to talk to you guys about is fashion. Really, this is where the topic of cultural appropriation comes up so much. Braids, do rags, you know, grills, uh, sneaker. Like, there's just so much cultural appropriation has become such a hot topic. The rise of rap videos helped bring black hairstyles and hair care into the mainstream by showcasing people rocking braids, cornrows, afros, and do rags. However, these all existed for generations earlier, some going back thousands of years. In Africa, how you wore your hair could tell people what tribe you belonged to or what your social status was, for example. Hairstyles have also been a way to maintain and protect cultural heritage. Braided cornrows were a way for African slaves to hide rice seeds and other grains on their heads as a way to bring parts of their homeland to wherever they were forced to go. It was a simple but powerful way of remembering where they came from in the face of cultural erasure. I kind of want to ask you about like how you feel about the do-rag, because I know that at the Grammys, on the red carpet, you wore that elegant 10-foot long do-rag. Like, yeah. What do you think? I think there's, there could be a time and a place for it. I've seen bro performing in the do-rag. It wasn't a black person on stage, and they definitely don't have black hair, and this was originally invented as a black hair care product, right, and that's what yeah. it still remains to be, even though us as a culture have elevated it to something that we use to accessorize style. in fashion and style now. It's just kind of futile because it won't give them waves. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> That's how I kind of look at it, just the functionality. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the functionality part of it because years ago I worked on a, a music video for a really famous Korean rapper and in one of the scenes, he was wearing a do-rag. And so I asked the director, I was like, this is a really interesting choice. Like, why, like, why is he wearing a do-rag? And the director, who is also Korean from Korea, he said, oh, because it's hip hop. Black rappers don't talk about what a do-rag is because we all just know what it's for. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't understand that. They don't get that because it's not talked about. But I think people just like see their favorite artists doing something and they want to emulate it. When I was younger, when I saw Beyonce or Destiny's Child have like the bandana in their hair, I was like, I want to put a bandana in my hair. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. we just look up to people and we want to be like them. But at the same time, like you said, it's just, <laughs> there's, a, there's a reason why do-rags were invented. Do you think that the imagery of do-rags in hip hop kind of made it seem as if it's just a fashion accessory to people who aren't black, who pe to people I think so. who, yeah. A lot of those artists were K-pop artists in Korea. Mm -hmm. They they see something and they like it, and it's attached to this art form that they love and appreciate, and they just wear it because they don't know. So I don't think it's necessarily appropriation. I think that it's more so, um, it's the times. Hip hop is the it thing. It's been the it thing for so long and people don't want to feel left out of the it thing. So yeah, you're going to want to feel like your favorite artist because you want to be just like them. It's yeah. not that you're trying to appropriate them. You're just... You're just a fan. Exactly, and you you're like, a fan. You, you like if you want to be great, you got to act great. Yeah. <laughs> Initially, like, what's your initial thoughts when you saw okay. something like that? Okay, that right there is a little something different. Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean... When I saw the girl with the, with the braids, I was like, oh, hold on. You know, it was kind of like... You know, yeah. I, I don't really, I don't really like it because it's like, you know, I feel like that's somebody else's culture, and you're kind of like trying to put yourself in their culture, you know. Mm -hmm. And it goes back into like where you came from, this type type of thing. It's even deeper than that. It's the understanding that Black people have had so many things taken from them, and not giving credit, mm -hmm. and not given uh, any kind of gain from it, mm -hmm. and they just take, right? So what if that Asian girl grew up in in the hood? Okay, that's, see, that's lucky different. Okay, 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 okay. I mean, again, I, I don't really like it because it's like, um, that's what black people do. Are you familiar with Jay Park? Yes, I am. Yes, you he are. He is so fun, <laughs> so fun. He did wear braids that one time. I was kind of like, ooh, you know, but then I'm like, he's still a cute one. So I was like, you know what, it, it's fine. <laughs> It's fine. Like braids is something that anybody could, I could braid my hair. Right, it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't make me any less white or any more black. It just makes me have braided hair. It's just the conversation. Like you see this young lady here and you just want to go, girl, 
your braids are tight. Where did you get them done? Did you know why folks started really braiding their hair like that? I know people always say you know the history, but the reason why it's kind of a cliche is because it's wild truth. Like, know the history. It saves so much worry and hostility and anger about, are you taking something from me? Because when you are black or, or just marginalized in any other way, and you feel like, you know, this is my thing. You guys have a lot as the larger culture, but this is my thing. And then you see it on somebody else, and you're like, but hold on, but th that's my thing. Mm -hmm. But that conversation, there's really not a place to have it because these are real feelings. It's about, it's about taking away a marginalized person's identity, um, their legacy, their impact on culture, and not for nothing, their financial gain. For, for me, everything starts with a conversation, right? And I think we also have to frame this in terms of understanding very clearly. I am acutely aware that we are talking about two marginalized communities, mm -hmm. right? You love hip hop. And to Danielle's point, to me, hip hop is the greatest global cultural force of perhaps centuries. It has changed how we walk, talk, dance, move, dress, love, commune, everything, and it is in every corner of this world. The cultural curiosity, to your point, right? What you were saying. Do you actually understand, you know, what is behind that? I'm not gonna indict this woman, nor is Danielle. I, we're not sitting here saying you can't do that, but you hope that she has a curiosity, mm -hmm. that she first has an understanding that she is wearing a style that is not Asian, clearly, right. right? And so in so doing, again, to the point about erasure, I would love it if she understood the history that Danielle is speaking about and if she could honor that. If you're enjoying all of the other trappings, and, and, and we all do, right? I rock Tim's, absolutely. But I hope <laughs> that people would say that my love of hip hop and the culture was also coupled with a curiosity and a respect mm. for the people and the voices and the respect minds and the history behind it. Yeah, I think respect is such a huge, a huge part of this conversation. No question. You know, thank you guys so much for having this conversation thank you for with having me. Us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah this was so Thank powerful. you for bringing us together. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad that this. this is the group that, yes. that made this happen. It was an absolute honor and privilege to chop it up with industry giants like Sophia and Danielle. But I wanted to explore things from a specific perspective, one like mine. Guap Dad 4000 is also black and Filipino, and I wanted to connect with someone who also lives their life at the crossroads of hip hop, race, and culture. <laughs> We're black and Filipino. We yep. have that shared experience. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about like what you have gone through specifically like in either community. I was really up under my Lola a lot. So as a kid, I really grew up feeling hella Filipino. Mm -hmm. I love the culture and I love to share the music, the food, especially stories and experiences about trips to the Philippines. A lot of times it was met with negativity mm -hmm. and stereotypes. People ask me if my my grandma eat dogs. Mm. You know, who is that Chinese lady? Mm -hmm. Why you live with that Chinese lady? Things like that. I do a lot of on the spot forgiving of people's ignorance. Yeah, you have to. Or else it's gonna kill you. Yeah, I don't know if you like can relate to this, but every time like a black person would say that you're not black, or a Filipino person was like you're not Filipino, like. It felt like an attack on my, like, who I was. Like, they were telling me that I couldn't be who I was. As a Filipino and black person who had gone through a phase of rejecting my Asianness, I also went through a phase of rejecting my blackness too, because I felt like if I fully accepted it, then I was erasing another part of me. Mm -hmm. So it's always been a tug of war within myself as well on what I want to highlight about me, because 
I am two worlds, but it's only two worlds to y'all. To me, it's me. Yeah. It's a delicate balance. I think people should play it to ear. Because mm -hmm. at the same time, these people are guests in our culture yeah. and in our music. So I'm not finna go out my way to break all this shit down yeah. to you. <laughs> Do your homework and know exactly. who house you walking in. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you in my house, I should tell you some rules real quick. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's a really good analogy. Do you feel that you are more accepted as a rapper because of your skin tone, even though you identify as also Filipino? Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I feel like... If I, and I, I never get to say this. That's my privilege. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't right. never got yeah, to say yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my privilege as um, a holder of this melanin. Yeah. I know what come with it. I've been uh, in pain for what come with it. I've been in joy for what come with it. But I also know what's behind it and my actual identity, which is why I go so hard talking about my culture. Mm -hmm. These are really difficult conversations to have, especially with strangers. Yeah. But I think sometimes they're just necessary. Actually, I think all the time they're necessary. Pretty much. Yeah. I really like this conversation. I'm glad we got to talk about this. <laughs> thank you for having me. Yeah, thank it's you for being It's been a pleasure. Here. Yeah. All these conversations have taught me that when we exploit and appropriate each other's cultures, we drive a wedge between people and continue a cycle of distrust and animosity. I don't know about you guys, but I'm tired of how our communities are often pitted against one another by the forces of segregation and competition that try to get us all to behave like crabs in a barrel. Instead, I want to work towards a future where our differences lead us towards meaningful conversations with one another, driven by curiosity and respect. Will you commit to this future with me? This was Tracing the Trend. Thanks for watching. Peace. Asia Jackson is many things. She's black and Filipino, an actress, and a self-proclaimed military brat whose travels with her family exposed her to a number of fascinating cultures. Her journey has taken her from acting to activism and the creation of a growing YouTube channel that focuses on the intersection of race, identity, and culture. Ah, Asia, so excited to be talking to you. Uh, you were exposed to a variety of different cultures growing up. How do you feel that really shaped your worldview? Uh, it shaped my worldview in every way, <laughs> you know? Like, as a black and Asian person, and also indigenous, my mom's an indigenous Filipino, and also being a military brat, I just have always been exposed to so many different cultures worldwide, and some cultures I was taken in, and some cultures I was rejected by, but uh, it gave me a really interesting perspective, you know, growing up, and it really gave me a fuller sense of how the world worked. Yeah. yeah. Growing up, for me, I didn't hear this word much, cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. But right now, we, we hear that a lot. Yeah. Um, it's all the time. Why do you think that's such a, a hot topic now? I think, for one, the internet. I feel like the internet exposed that concept to a, like a mainstream audience. You know, cultural appropriation was uh, it was first coined in the 90s and it was very much in like an academic setting. But now yeah. with the internet, you know, people are talking about it more and it's like getting to the young people. Have you been able to break through with certain generations yeah. that have been in that place where because I find that sometimes when I'm talking with my mother, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, okay Ma, this is, uh, you know, this, this is where we are right now. You got to open <laughs> your mind. Is it a generational thing in discussing this? I'm a younger millennial, um, but like, especially like Gen Z and like the younger millennials, this is, this has been a topic that has been on the internet. Like oh, we yeah. grew up with like these types of conversations. So I feel like younger people are definitely a lot more open. I found some breakthroughs with my family for sure. I had to explain it in a way that made sense for them. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it would be through like, a, like telling a story of like someone experiencing uh -huh. it. You know what I mean? What do you say your motivation has been to actually open up this discussion and tackle something this heavy or that can be this heavy? Unity. But as a black and Asian person, you know, I've seen two these two communities like butting heads all the time. I've seen these two communities come together and it's a really beautiful thing when it does happen. But, you know, some of the discourse that you do see online, it's very di divisive. And I think, you know, one way to mitigate 
<laughs> the divisiveness is to have like open communication, open and honest communication. We really appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, we appreciate you. Thank you for joining us. Of course, thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs> it's been roughly 40 years since the public was provided with the first official report on AIDS. Since then, more than 32 million people have died from AIDS-related illnesses globally, including 700,000 people here in the U.S. These deaths hit queer communities, especially black and brown, hard. And we'd like to take a moment to celebrate their lives and acknowledge those losses. In the decades since, we've all become much more aware of what HIV is, but there is still a lingering reluctance to talk about it or to even know how to talk about it, especially in the black queer community. This next episode, HIV, Living Positively, features creator Justin James, along with some special friends as they shine a light on their shared experiences. What is going on? This is your boy, Justin J, AKA The King of Reeves, and I am excited to have y'all join me today. We are about to get into some conversations in a brunch style setting. As you can tell, things are different. I got the chefs behind me. They are in here cooking, they are in here saucing it up. And we about to talk about some things that I've been waiting to do, but bigger and special. So I'm bringing together some of my amazing friends and allies to have a conversation about a topic that is really personal to me, HIV stigma and discrimination. We got my boy Byron Jamal, the love guru, who is helping me with my dating life so that I can stop dealing with these trash men. My homegirl, public health educator and human rights activist, Marnina Miller. And the doll, former mother of the Royal Ballroom House of LaBeja, fine artist and HIV activist, Kia LaBeja. And you all know I couldn't do this without them. Award-winning writer of All Boys Are in Blue, a memoir manifesto, and HIV activist, George M. Johnson. Come judge for me, daughter. You know her from the Emmy, GLAAD, and Peabody Award-winning series, Pose, on FX. Fashion icon and actress, Dominique Jackson. And y'all know I can't just have anybody in the kitchen cooking, so I got Chef M, Culinary Institute of America alum, who has served the likes of Michelle Obama, period. I hope y'all excited about it, and we're gonna get into this conversation, and I hope that you're ready for it, because I don't even think you are. We oh, are really? the guests. Oh my, absolutely. And it's a, it's a war for me. It's a war for me. Why? Wow. Absolutely, yes. Hi, nice to meet you. Y'all are here. Oh my God. <laughs> In the flash. <laughs> Absolutely. So, but we're gonna join over here and sit down, and we're gonna get into a brunch and some other conversations. Ooh. I hope y'all are ready for them. Let's yes, go. Yes, we are. Right here <laughs> the category is dating, disclosure, and doing it. Now, take it from me. Dating can be the ghetto, and living with HIV can make it even more ratchet. But that's why I'm opening up the conversation with my pause friends and non-pause friends, Dominique and Byron. I got all you here today. Mm -hmm. And I wanted people like us um, who are positive, but the experiences are like, you know, dating and getting to know folks and all the other stuff. I don't even go on a date prior to disclosing. Like, okay. because I'm not even gonna entertain like being out in public and some type of weird interaction. Or reaction. You didn't know or reaction happened. And so prior to me even going on dates or anything, people already know that I'm HIV positive. You know, I think my experience is a little different because okay. I was born with HIV. So I'm a long-term survivor. Yeah, so I've been yeah. living with HIV for 31 years. Wow. And so for me, it's not just like I go on a date and I have to disclose. It's like I've been dealing with that since I was a little mm -hmm. child. After my mother died, it was like no one was there to tell me hmm. what to do, you know? So I have to go through this as an infant and a child and a preteen and a teenager. And then coming into adulthood and having these sexual relationships, it's like I didn't know mm -hmm. how to disclose, you know? And I had moments where I didn't at first, you know, because I didn't know what to do, you know? I don't want to feel like I'm not sexy or I'm not pretty or I'm not beautiful or I'm going to be denied or any of that. So, Kia, I'm glad that you brought that up because I think everybody's, like, diagnosis and everybody's experience around HIV is different. Um, like you said, you were born with HIV. And you get asked that question, who gave you HIV? And I'm like, girl, like, for me, for myself personally, no one gave me HIV. I had consensual sex with all of my partners, and I contracted the virus that I'm taking care of and I'm living, period. So I'm gonna move on to like Marnina because you know, your experience is probably like similar to mine. And how do you navigate that when people ask you, 
who gave you HIV? Oh, that is such a heavy subject because as a black cisgender woman, although we only make up 7% of the population, we make up 60% of those that are living with HIV. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't understand that or know that statistic. And so because of the violence that's perpetuated against women living with HIV bodies, I have to be very careful about the conversations that I have around disclosure, around talking about my experience, around telling folks my diagnosis. And so I automatically go into the conversation of, it's not your business. <laughs> you in my business. Don't, Don't do, do that. that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my story to tell. Period. Because that is a traumatic experience. Mm-hmm. And that is trauma field. Mm-hmm. And we have to be careful about letting everyone know our story. Mm-hmm. Especially people that do not giving up the coin. You're not giving up the coin. You're not. Or the, or the cakes, you know. <laughs> Do you deserve my story? Period. And as a queer woman, it is a different experience for me, and so I do go into detail and explain it if I feel comfortable enough to do so. But I think it's up to everyone to help end the HIV epidemic, those that are living with HIV and those that are negative. I, I'm an activist out of love and necessity love and coin. <laughs> 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 right. Thank you for that because yeah. it is educating now because now I can go out and I can say to people that protection is not just about condoms. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right? Thank you. So for me, it was I'm not touching anyone because I was in a community where every time I turned around, someone was HIV positive and being an immigrant, if I contracted HIV, I may not have been able to get my green card. So I was very skeptical. I was very, it was always about no. Even if someone rumored it, it was no. It's about being able to communicate and the fact of the blaming. I'm so glad that you are here for this conversation because it lets us know like how disclosure works, not as a person who's living with HIV and AIDS, but as a trans woman. like. It's all connected. That's the thing is that it really starts with education. Because yes. when people don't know and they don't know what they don't know, yes. they get into these kind of situations. Yes. And I think that's why these kind of conversations are yes. so important. So I was gonna say, like, Dominique, as a person, like, you're not living with HIV, but you understand what it is for people like us um, who are positive, like, what, what the experiences are, like, you know, dating. Well, the familiarity for me is that um, I have, um, I was going home in a cab one night with my kids, and one said to me, Mom, I can't hold this anymore. I'm HIV positive. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, I looked to the other one for support, and it, it was, there was a bit of confusion because here's a 17-year-old kid, kid telling me that they're, they're positive and looking to me as their mother. And I'm like, oh, my God, okay. And so as I look to the right, my son on the right says to me, yeah, Mom, I'm positive too. Mm-hmm. Who we are? or what we have is a curse Mm -hmm. because society Mm -hmm. makes us feel like that. For me, I took that shit back, right? Me being trans, me being black, me being an immigrant does not mean that I cannot be loved. Mm -hmm. It meant that I had to fight Mm -hmm. harder to find that love. Mm -hmm. But I would find true love because for someone to respect me for who I am and love me meant that they did their research and they have the heart that I need. Mm. And that's how I relate to disclosure. Wow. See, the, the, like, your experience, even though you're, like, negative, like, you're still very much in this conversation about disclosure and how important a person, that it's just not me as a person living with HIV, to be informed and all that. It's all of our jobs. It's also... HIV criminalization laws. Government's response to its own failure is to criminalize those who they harm the most. Period. Right? And so when it came to HIV, it was like, okay, literally, it was the government's failure because Ronald Reagan ignored it for almost a decade. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you got to 1991, which was 10 years after the first case, that was when they put the Ryan White's Care Act in. That's when he started actually doing support for people living with HIV. But then they started criminalizing all of these bills across the country around the criminality of a person transmitting the virus started to come up, right? right? And so government's, you know, failure in that has basically taken something like that we weren't responsible for mm-hmm. and now has placed the burden on us. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking, like, um, when it comes to outing, like, how do you even na- navigate that? Like, Marnini, have you ever had a situation where you 
may have like thought a person was going to out you or you seen another friend be outed or something? I had a family member personally out me. Wow. Yeah, so we were at the club and <laughs> we was, we was at the club. It always started out at the club. <laughs> How did I get here? <laughs> We were at the club and we were dancing and having a good time. And like we were talking about desirability politics, she was a thinner woman. And so I thought the guys would find her more attractive. But the guys were all on me. I live in Texas. And so they like them thick and high. <laughs> and so he's up on me and I'm like, oh, hold on. I had just received my diagnosis a couple months prior. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like, what are you doing? Like, get off of me. I'm not in the mood today. Mm -hmm. And so he ended up, you know, giving me his number later on. I, I took it down, okay. and she wrote his number down as well. Mm. And so she called and told him about my status. Wow. And a couple months later, me and him were hanging out. We're out to eat, and he's like, oh, come back to my house. I'm like, okay. So we get to chilling on his couch at his house, and he turns to me, and he goes, is it true because your cousin told me that you could give me AIDS? Wow. And at that moment, my heart started racing. Wow. Because 70% of cisgender black women that are living with HIV have experienced intimate partner violence. Yeah. And that is really, really serious. Safety. And so my safety, like, my, my yeah, antennas yeah, went yeah, up. Yeah, like, yeah. is he gonna hurt me? Yeah. But... Because why would he know this information and didn't yeah. bite you over? Like, what is your... What, what are you what trying to do? What is your intent? Yeah, so, I may not get it, but um, it's not the same situation, but I can feel that. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I yeah. really can. Yeah. We're talking about disclosure, yes. In that moment, mm -hmm. uh -huh. right, you don't know what they're gonna do to you, mm. what's gonna happen to you, mm -hmm. and that was really horrible. Whew. I had been disclosed to this person I was talking to, and you know, we yin yin around the house. We had a little one, a little one, two, a little pull up at. Smack and tickle. A little, little, little bit. It was, it was giving. I love smack and tickle. Like and the next girl. day or two, they text me and they was talking about some, well, you know, I've been coughing the last couple of days. Ooh. And I'm like, that's like, this was. <laughs> so ridiculous. I'm like, I'm like, coughing, girl. Like, it, like what's, what's going on? Like, you I would have said, get some Theraflu. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get have a humidifier in your house? <laughs> like, so, and immediately, like, I'm feeling shame. Like, I have done yeah. something. Yeah. Like, like, even though I know I've been, like, all of my things are good, like, I didn't get my, all my tests back and stuff, it's just like, oh, my gosh, what if I have? And it's just, even the stigma was working on me because I feel dirty and unclean. I don't know if anyone else has had this experience, but these exact words, that I risked my life for you. Ooh. I don't know if anyone's Ooh. felt that one. I felt that one multiple times. Wow. And I felt that usually at the end of a relationship Ooh. where it was like this. And it's like, you know that my worst nightmare wow. would be for me to transmit this virus to you. And I'm doing everything in my power to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. And you're going to say, I risked my life from you. And you're also going to say to me, oh, you might have given it to me. Mm. That's when you got to take them and you go, let's go get tested. Mm. As someone who is not considered desirability by society standards, as a fat black woman that's queer, that's yes. also living with HIV, mm. it is so much, like, it is so heavy on me. Yeah. And so sometimes I don't feel vulnerable enough to be able to tell someone my whole truth about everything I'm experiencing because folks will weaponize it yeah. and make me feel less than for how I'm feeling or they'll use it against me like you were saying about oh I risked my life for you or oh now people know that I like fat women you know mm -hmm. folks will weaponize yeah. that stuff yeah, against so. you kind of hearing from it is like this false positivity when I walk in the room I'm a bad bitch like period but the world is always taking away from that. So, so I can let me just interject. They, people try to cut you off in that sense of blame yourself. Yeah. yeah. You're doing, the, what we were speaking of earlier, the guilt, right? Yeah. You feel like you're not worthy and you feel like you did something wrong when you are two consenting adults in that relationship. So now that it's over and I don't want you to weaponize mm -hmm. my truth. Yes means that you're the lowest of the low. Yeah. Keep stepping. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's happened to me multiple times. It's not just one time, but I've been in multiple situations where I felt that. And it, it's that moment that takes away that self-love. It's that moment where you're like, dang, did I? Did I? Am I? Yeah, I you know, and you that 
really messes with this, and it messes with this, mm -hmm. and it messes with every future experience that you have. I don't think we are vulnerable enough with each other. We're not. In our community. I feel like we, even if we disclose, I feel like the stories of, of what happened and how it happened and how it made us feel, I don't feel like we share that deep enough because yeah. When we do, the stories like how you link together in your storylines, it, it comes out and you realize, wow, we really are experiencing many of the same emotions, many of the same fears, mm -hmm. de depressed moments of anxiety. Like we're dealing with the same, same stuff. Like just to let your guard down and just have a moment where you can just be you. We have really dived into this conversation. We've gotten into some things. I've learned a lot. I've learned. I it's, have it's really been... learned. I'm educated yes. a lot more. It was dope. So we got Chef M bringing. We going to One more round. Cheers. One more round. One more round. OK, let me go ahead. <laughs> Those drinks look amazing, Chef M. Yeah, they yeah. do. So they do. I made a blueberry syrup. OK. Like, so we just take it, strain it out. And then there's a little bit of Pim's dry vermouth. Oh, it smells and, amazing. And uh, a very aromatic gin. I want us all to go around, starting with you, my Nina, and we're gonna cheers, we're gonna celebrate, we're gonna toast to the ancestors, to the folks who came before us and did this work to move us forward, to carry these conversations so we can pass it on the next generation. So I want you to start with you, my Nina. Mm -hmm. Who are you cheering to? Who are you celebrating? Who are you? Who are you who are you giving that energy to? I'm calling into the room Marsha P. Johnson. Yes. None of us as black queer yes. folks will be able to be authentically ourselves wow. without her story and her influence and for her throwing that brick. <laughs> <laughs> so shouts out to sis. Yeah, absolutely. That's your joy. I'm gonna call into the room Dr. Ron Simmons. Uh, Dr. Ron Simmons was a pioneer in HIV, not just HIV work, but holistic work before there was any treatment in the Washington, DC area. Dr. Ron Simmons has saved countless lives, tens of thousands of lives of black queer people, uh, including myself, mm -hmm. uh, as he was one of my boss. He was a radical. Mm -hmm. He went about this uh, from the perspective of there is no such thing as a no when mm -hmm. my people are dying. Absolutely. And so um, that is who I want to bring into the room. And I feel like I carry much of the work that I do is uh, to honor all of the work that he uh, left behind. Much you, Kia. Well, first and foremost, I'm always going to bring my mother into the room, Quan Bennett, yes. who left us in 2004. All the work that she did was I'm really sure, important. Yeah. I'm also like to recognize the women that did a hearing that made the CDC change the AIDS definition mm -hmm. to include women's issues. Oh. Yes. yes. Awesome. So I want to I want to bring into the room the pioneers of ballroom: Ava Spindavis, mm -hmm. Dorian Corey, Pepe Labeja, yes. uh, Paris Dupree. I would also like to bring in Octavia St. Laurent, Danielle Ravlon, and I would also like to bring into those to this room all of those who have given their lives in us being able to sit here today and have this conversation. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I bring into the room La Prince Wheeler, who is my cousin who passed of HIV. And lastly, I bring in James Baldwin, who, because of his writing, helped me be free. Uh, both of them taught me to fight for what is right and to love without failing, so. And the person I am calling on and speaking love to is my brother who recently passed away a couple of months ago. He was the first person that I told that I was positive and I tested positive and he's been there for me. Even in his passing, he's been carrying me on, like literally putting and working and doing all these things uh, while remembering him and thinking about him has been it's been a lot, but I know that he is very proud of me and pushing me forward to continue to do great things with great people like you all. So I really appreciate that. And you know, we ain't gonna have, we gonna end on no sad moment. We gonna cheers to all the folks That's who came right. before us and, and will come after us. That's big. Period. Cheers. Uh, one big one in the middle. Absolutely. Yeah. Cheers to Justin James, the King of Reads, is a YouTube personality whose channel and website gives him a platform to take deep dives into a wide range of topics, from pop culture to social issues to sex and beyond. He's a well-known and well-respected advocate and activist in the black LGBTQ community.
Justin, thank Ooh, you so much I for feel joining. So like you well, reading well, all of that. Once, once it was like King Breathe, went up. <laughs> once I said King Breathe, I said yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That was absolutely. A great. What made you choose like dating and disclosure as the topic? I recently became single, yeah. and like the last couple of months, so I was getting back into the dating field, like, yeah. and I'm like, oh, I have to once again start to disclose that I'm. HIV positive yeah. mm -hmm. to people I'm meeting online, like when I'm on the apps and stuff. And this is something I haven't thought about in the last two, three years because I was in a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So this was like, there's so many conversations I want to have, but I was like, this one is so important. Yeah, and you created this content. Not only created it, but you decided to star in it. Like, where did that come from? What made you want to star in it? It came from friends holding me accountable. Um, yes, we love accountability. So <laughs> yes. one of my friends a long time ago, um, before I started getting into the work that I'm doing now, they said, hey, you know, I've noticed that you've had some problematic things that you said about people living with HIV. Now, this was 10 years ago oh, now. Wow. Yeah, so they were just like, you need to do a better job of how you embrace and have conversations. So I took it upon myself to start to use my platform to educate folks. Because at first I was just doing like reality show reviews, just sure. laughing, just, you know, yeah. having a good time. But I found out how important it was. And when I started to speak about things, people felt connected even more to me. Yeah. And that was very important. I really me. love how you, you know, we're in such an era right now where everything is like, oh, once you've done it, you can't change. You can't become someone new. You can't become uh, more informed. Mm -hmm. And so I love mm -hmm. that you spoke on the fact that your friends, yes, called you out, mm -hmm. but yeah. said, yeah, just just approach it, man. Just just say the real truth. You know, say something, you know, you know, more positive and mm -hmm. open up that door for conversation. That's how it should be done. So shout out to your friends yeah, for absolutely. doing it like that. And I, I'm actually thankful that I was ready to receive because sometimes, yeah. you know, we might tell somebody, hey, like, what you said, it ain't really given, but you might, your response might be, well, I said what I said, yeah. and you just gonna have to deal with yeah, it. Yeah, you're giving a nene response. So, you know, you know. <laughs> so I was ready to receive it, and I think that's very much, like, important oh, yeah. to awesome. continue on. What do you hope that the audience will learn about, you know, HIV living positively? I want them to learn that it's all our jobs. Um, and there's no right or wrong. It's about knowing our sexual health, being comfortable, creating space where people can feel comfortable yeah. talking about what they got going on. Yeah. So I think it's all our jobs to, to have this conversation. And normalize the reality, yes. yes. People yeah. are living with this, yes. and that's okay. Mm -hmm. With a lot of misinformation going mm -hmm. on out there, what do you want people to, what's the information, what do you want people to leave with from this episode? Maybe you're not a part of the LGBTQ plus community. Mm -hmm but you have someone in your family or a loved one or a friend or somebody who your coworker who might be in the community who might be affected by HIV yeah. and AIDS. So it's important for all of us to do this work so we can live in a better world. That's yeah. the importance for me. Like take this away, take this information and create a safe space for folks who are living with HIV and AIDS. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, wow. yes, yes. Thank you so much, Justin. Thank you for the I work you're doing. Yeah. And we we yeah. appreciate you for joining us. Thank I appreciate you, you all for yeah. amplifying the conversation. Yes, appreciate Thank you. you. Thank you. Love. <laughs> Ready for our next episode? First off, I love the idea of Soul Swap. It's a great idea. I'm hooked from the beginning. It was created by host and sneaker expert, Jock Slade, who literally stepped in the shoes of another to see what it's like to live their life. His mission, to learn about remarkable figures in our culture, the causes they believe in, the experiences that make them who they are. And he did so by swapping shoes with acclaimed singer, Tanache. Here's Soul Swap with Jock Slade. What's up, everyone? I'm Jacques Slade, an online video creator that's eternally curious. I started on YouTube 10 years ago in a garage with a green screen and a dream. Today, I have over 1.3 million subscribers. While I can tell you everything you need to know about sneakers, there is a big world out there that's begging to be explored. So come along with me as I live a day in the life of some of the most successful and engaging personalities in the world. This is Soul Swap. Today, I'm meeting up with singer-songwriter Tanache, and she sent me this box. Let's take a look inside. A water bottle, so I imagine that means we're gonna do something athletic today. A martial arts belt, okay, I'm down with that. Oh, haha. -ha. And a microphone. I think I'm gonna enjoy this. Let's put this back inside and go meet up with Tanache. Tanache! 
She sings, dances, acts, and is an all-around boss. I'm here to find out how Tinashe takes creative control over her art, addresses her fears head-on, while living her life as an advocate for social justice. Hey, hey, great to see you. Good to see you How too. How are you? I just want you to know I have like three and a half bars whenever you're ready. Oh, perfect. So uh, I'm here because uh, my job is to live the life of some of the coolest people in the world Ooh, today. Ooh, okay. And so, are you uh, ready? I, I think so. I want to teach you some moves. I want to show you okay. some of the outfits that I've had to wear on tour. Just okay. kind of take you through what it's like to prep for a show. When you're getting ready for a show, what's that preparation like? For me, it really starts with Picking out the set list, deciding what songs I want to perform, getting the music together, coming up with some steps or how I kind of envision it on the stage. And then from there, it's getting into all the little details. How do we want the stage set up? What are we going to wear? What is the lighting going to look like? What are the screens going to look like? And then integrating it all together. As an artist, it seems like you're like completing the whole experience for the fan. Totally. Jeez, that sounds so complicated. Yeah, it's That's, fun. But it's, it seems it's like it's fun, fun but like when it all comes together. Yeah. I think about like the music industry is notorious for really shaping artists into what they want the artist to be. And especially as a black woman, it seems like that can be hard trying to live up to the expectations of the music industry and really staying true to yeah. yourself. How do you balance those two worlds? I think I'm really lucky because I'm an independent artist now, so I've been able to kind of gain my footing in this industry while I was signed to a major label. I learned a lot about how the game works. Right. I learned a lot. Yeah. I got a lot of inside knowledge and experience, and now that I'm independent, I'm able to use all that knowledge to create the art that I really want to make. I'm just 100% in charge of that creative. I'm wow. able to do what I want to do. I'm able to be who I want to be. I don't have to make any type of compromises or try to fit into try any box. In. Congratulations on, on being independent, seeing black entrepreneurialism. I love it. Thank I love you. It. Recently, we've gone through a lot of social justice movement, and you were a big part of that. You really kind of stepped out Thank in you. the forefront of that, of that conversation, like with the Black Lives Matter movement. How important is that to you? When it came to Black Lives Matter movement and being involved in social justice, it just felt really authentic to who I am. It seemed like it was something that was so important to me at a core level that it only made sense that I would express it in right. my art and yeah. in, you know, the platform that I've been given as a you know, public figure, yeah. I think that's why we're here, is to be given these platforms to touch people, to make a difference, to champion it in any way that I can and spread the message in any way that I can, use my platform, so yeah. I respect that. You were talking about confidence, and uh, I was doing my research, because I knew I was gonna walk in your steps today. Yeah. And uh, I heard you did like Taekwondo as a kid. <laughs> I like, did. Like a lot of time for kids, that's about confidence. Do you feel like yeah. that helped you a lot? That helps me frame how I look at my music and my art now. I don't feel the need to like pick and choose one thing. If I'm inspired by, okay, I wanna make this right now or I wanna make something that sounds like that, then I'll just kind of go for it and follow that dream and, and see it through to fruition. And that was kind of the case with Taekwondo. Definitely just got another thing on my bucket list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's super cool, so yeah. Part of this is for me to kind of live your life for a day, yeah. so I think I'm ready. Yes, so perfect. I'm, you ready? Yeah, I think okay. I'm ready. I have my choreographer here. I think it'd be perfect if you learned some from the actual show. Okay. If you think you got what it takes. I, I, I think. <laughs> I think that's okay, what you Okay, cool. Are. This is my choreographer, Adrian. Hey, what up, man? Adrian. Adrian. How you doing, hey. man? He's going nice to teach going. you some nice of my Pasadena choreography from my song Pasadena. Okay. I've been to Pasadena before, so I feel like perfect. that... I, sh I should knock this out pretty quickly. Good. Okay. And you already, you already hit the curve. Man. Okay. You already All right. Let's Make go. Sure. I'm in the Pasadena. <laughs> All right. All this. Wait, hey, wait. Where are you going? Are you? I got rehearsal. Uh, but. Okay, cool. So we're gonna start off. We're gonna bring our right leg up twice as okay. we turn to the left a little bit. Okay. And as we do that, we're gonna put the arms down. So the left arm comes back, and the right goes down. Yeah. I know. Like when you dance, you gotta be like. Kill the mosquito, kill the mosquito. It's and more then, like, like... Kill the mosquito, kill the... No? Because that's a down. We want to go up, up. Oh, up. up. Yeah. It's got okay. a groove. Okay. Yeah. okay. Up. Yeah, you got it. Come okay. on. Yeah, hey. Okay. Hey, okay. there we go. Yeah, All right. yeah, yeah. So we're here. Then one, two, three, four, step, step. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So it's not just my feet moving. My whole body has to be involved in this process. Dancing. Dance. Dancing. It's a, dancing. It's a whole... Body experience. Experience. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Five, six, whoa, seven. Whoa, whoa, whoa! So fast. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Tanache learns very quickly. That she does do. So you live in a day in the life for her. Okay. From here, 
you're gonna roll, so think like a body roll. A body roll? Yeah, okay. yeah. I can do one body of those. rolls. Yeah, body but this rolls. time you're gonna do it and you're gonna take it oh, around. Oh, so body rolling, wait, mm -hmm. ooh. Am I, am, I, am I body rolling left to right or right to left? Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, and five. Clap, clap, oh. clap. Back, front, back, front. Clap, clap. Oh, clap. oh I just gotta focus on my feet. I'm just, I keep planting myself. It's all right, it's all right, look. You gotta, you know, you gotta keep your mind Keep, right. you keep focused. Don't get frustrated, right. you get it. You got time. It's fine. Right. Up, up, down. Out, think out, yeah. Five, let's go slow. We got one, two, three, four, and five. Clap. All right, let's try it. Let's, let's go like real speed, like real, real speed. Yeah. Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, and five. Clap, clap, clap. One, two, three, six, seven, eight. There we go. Yeah, okay. You getting them right. tugs. I see the tugs. I can tug. I can tug. You tugging. You tugging. I think this is good. That's as good as it's going to happen today. <laughs> Man. Step one is done, and I am tired. Who knew how much hard work and dedication it took to be a superstar? But it's part of the process. We're doing this as a day in the life. And part of that is going back to Sinashe's past to find where she centers herself in the discipline. And that's all about Taekwondo. So we're gonna go try that right now. All right. Choreography is done. I feel good, I practice, I feel like I have all of my steps together, but if I'm gonna keep it a buck, I'm a little bit nervous because I actually have to perform for Tanache later, which is why I'm here at a Taekwondo studio and Master Edward is gonna show me how to do the self-discipline that I need so that I'm not nervous and I can get all these steps down and it'll be easy peasy. So Master Edward, I think I'm ready to go. How do I start? You're pretty much ready. Just take your shoes off and we'll get started. Shoes, yes. The, the sneakerhead in me thought that I could wear them, but obviously I can't. So, okay, I think I'm ready to start. Bao? Can you talk a little bit about the philosophies of Taekwondo? So basically, it's not just about kicking and punching. Taekwondo revolves a, a, around uh, five tenets, which is uh, courtesy, integrity, self-control, perseverance and indomitable spirit. So the, the main things is uh, basically to learn how to behave, how to treat people, how to interact with people, and then basically by working so hard on everything and just setting goals to yourself, it translates in real life where you learn how to calm down, how to focus, how to set a goal. So can we try some stuff? Though? Sure, Let, let's, okay. let's do let's some do kicks. It. From uh, fighting sense, you're gonna pick it up as high as you can and bring it back down and you gotta yell, Kia. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Try to go as far as possible to the outside. Okay. Yeah. 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 Taekwondo. Yeah. All right. Very well. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to some board breaking. Okay. 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 So uh, let me show you. All right. So we, we have we have some boards right here. I'll show you how to break this and not to hurt yourself. Okay. Okay, so first one, what we're going to do is we're going to do a hammer fist, so uh -huh. fighting stance. Fighting stance. Okay, close your fist strong. Fist and close. then what you're going to do is, uh, from here, you're gonna step in, you're gonna pick your fist up, step, and just punch all the way through. Hit the so, board, okay? So step, and punch yep. all the way through. Okay. Yes. Okay, ready? Okay. <laughs> yes. All right, let's see. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, just when you hit it, hit it hard and loud, kia. Okay. Kia! One more time. Just hit it harder. Okay. All the way through. Okay. Yeah! Perseverance, I think that's the hardest one because you gotta just keep pushing through. It doesn't matter how, how hard it is. It doesn't matter how many times you fail. Until you succeed. One more time. Yeah! Good job. All right, nice. And okay. now what we're going to do is same way, but we're gonna do a ax kick. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna pick your leg up, and then, uh, so same way, fighting sense, you're gonna pick your leg up, up, and then down, and kia. Okay. okay. All right, let's see, ready? Okay. Yeah. Good job. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank Very you. Well. Good job. Wow. Uh, Master Edward, 
Thank you so, so much. This was incredible. Like, I, I've never learned this before, so this was like my first opportunity to really get a, a piece of this world. And now I kind of understand the discipline that Tanasha has, the, the perseverance that she has. Like, it all comes to play just in practicing Taekwondo, and you are an amazing instructor. So thank you, thank you. Master Edward. Thank you so much. Great job. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, well, we're just getting started. Yeah, it's a lot. It's honestly, I'll say this: like I knew a lot of work went into what you were doing. Yeah. But this was more than I expected, and I have a whole new level of respect for what you do. Like for Thank sure. You. Thank 100%. you. One hundred percent. I see we have some wardrobe here. Yep. Uh, that goes into the process as well. Yeah. I ain't even thinking about what I'm gonna wear. Is all of this custom? Yeah. Like the silver boots. Okay. So that's what. Wait. That's taller than you. Oh yeah, my God. you know. <laughs> they go oh up to my, my boots. Oh my God. You dance in heels? I, I, okay, I you can don't barely have to do dance that in tennis shoes, so <laughs> I don't know how that's gonna work. Good vibes. You know what? This does give you an energy. Right? It and does then you're give like, you energy. I'm here. Yeah, I feel like I can just like come out to the middle of the stage. Yeah. Just be like, bun, bun, bun. Exactly. So I like to switch up my outfits, you know, show to show. So we got mm -hmm. like a purple version as well. You know, it's very much giving purple rain. Yeah, purple rain kind of vibes. You know? I feel that. I feel that energy. Then this last one, I think this chartreuse number is really cute too. So chartreuse. Chartreuse. You know, it's very on trend this season. It, it, Fashion -wise. I love it. It really is. That. So we got this. Vibe. This is like a nice little moment on stage, and she's sheer so the lights can shine through it. It's like purposeful. Like it's not just like, oh, I'm wearing something cool. I'm wearing totally. something that kind of gives me like an energy or a vibe. Yeah, I mean, well, when we're on stage and we're doing a show, we're translating that story like we talked about earlier. You really have to sell the energy that the song is bringing to the audience. So I think a lot of my songs have that kind of like bad bitch energy. So a lot of my outfits are giving bad bitch. I like it. You know, it's it's super important to feel your best self when you're on stage. This, you just this, embody it. I feel like I'm in theater. I feel like I should be like, and then the fall. Exactly. I feel that. Like I just feel. See, I just, all we have to do is mood. throw this on you, and you're like already a different person. Yeah, it gives you it gives you a mood. Think you could rock this? I think I could do that. Well, okay. I'll let you change. Wait, and then you it's time for your big performance. You want me to perform in this? Yes. I'll be waiting um, for you at the stage. Okay. All right, we get any, any advice? You just, just keep walking just off, huh? On. Just keep leaving me by myself. It's <laughs> fine. I'm okay with that. Yo. Wow. I know. Look at it. It's Looking a, good. Yeah, it's a vibe. I like the energy yes, here. Yes, you look amazing. Thank you. You know what? I put these on, and I felt like a totally different person. Yeah, gets you in a character, right? Yeah, like, like I see why, like, the hood and all that stuff you were talking about, it really puts you in a certain kind of place. Totally. I it brings it. it out. It makes it easier to perform. Right. Absolutely. So are you ready Absolutely. for your performance? I, th I think I am. I, I worked on it. I worked on it a lot, uh, probably more than you work on it, but I worked <laughs> on it quite a bit. And I feel like I feel like I'm ready. I think I'm ready. It's, All right. it's a little nerve wracking. I'll be honest to you do it in this. front of you. You got this. You like, got this. this. No pressure. Thing. No, no pressure. pressure. Okay. All right. You know, All right. just yeah. just have fun. All right. Have Let's a good time. It. Hit it. Here we go. Here we go. Five, six, five, six, seven, eight. Hey, hey. 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 Oh my God! Fire. I don't. I cannot explain to you how nervous that makes me. Oh my gosh! You did you. so good. But you do. You get into character and like thinking about this. Like, how do you do this and sing at the same time? Like <laughs> I, that was just a little bit, and I'm yeah. tired already. Yeah. You know, I think just practice. Honestly, I've been doing this for a while. Yeah. We do rehearse a lot. I have done so many shows, right. and I think that the only way that you can really practice for like being in the moment on stage is on stage yeah. because there's a whole other adrenaline factor that kicks in yes. as well. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and you give it way more energy than you would ever give it in a rehearsal setting. One hundred percent. Because it was different when I was practicing to when it just happened just yeah. now. It's it's a totally different vibe, totally different energy. Totally. No, I I am blown away by how much work you do. The fact that you sing, the fact that you dance, 
all at the same time. You gotta worry about the lights, <laughs> about the stage and the audience. Like, I didn't even have to worry about the audience. I had to be like, everybody wave your hands. Hey, I'm the audience. Uh, yeah, you are the audience. Everybody you wave your it. hands, wave your hands. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming to rehearsal and Absolutely. like checking out the vibes. I think there's like one more thing that maybe you could get into just okay. to get really involved in my life. Okay. You know, I love to be involved in the community. I right. think that that's really important. So how do you feel about maybe going and speaking with some Black Lives Matter community leaders? I think that'd be like a really great way to just get to know like a day in my world. Like just the like full The full picture. Experience. I thought it was just music and dancing, but you know what? If it's gonna give me a more complete picture of what you do and what it's like to be you, I'm all for it. Let's get it. Let's do it. Sounds good. All right, we just finished our performance, and now I'm going to go speak to some BLM organizers. In 2020 alone, Tanache participated in nine Black Lives Matter protests between LA and DC. Today, she continues to communicate social messages through her art and public platform. By sending me to meet with BLM LA chapter representatives Megan and Joseph, I'm hoping it will give me a better picture of Tanache's commitment to being a community advocate. So let's go inside and meet the organizers. I just want to say thank you guys for joining me today, Joseph, Megan. When it comes to Black Lives Matter, it means different things to different people. What does it mean to you two individually? I work in education, I work with youth. That intersects with the, the Black Lives Matter work that we do as we push for police-free schools. Um, and it's super personal, you know, for me um, as, as somebody who was incarcerated as a, as a youth out of schools um, and knows, you know, the fact that we need different resources and supports in our school system for our kids and not cops and criminalization. In reality, it's an affirmation for black folks to really understand the fullness of their selves, right? And the way that that shows up for me is making sure that we're organizing folks to organize themselves, right? So one of the things that we're really heavy into right now is budget interrogation, right? So this idea of justice reinvestment, we're investing our dollars into things that actually make a difference, right? Into things that actually keep us safe. So thinking about Black Lives Matter, a lot of it is seen through the eyes of protesting. And it can be a scary thing. What are some of the things you recommend for people that have a fear of protesting? I'm always reminded of a Frederick Douglass quote, power concedes nothing without demand, right? And so, you know, if we see that there are things that are going on in the world that are wrong, that are unjust, and we know you know, that it's not gonna change without us demanding it. And then for me, it's, and we say this often in, in BLM, it's like our, our sacred duty. It's so important to organize ourselves to take power and ownership over our movement, our demands, our lives. And so that's, that's part of what protesting is. There's a way that you're supposed to protest where you're not putting yourself or others in harm's way. Um, I think it's kind of what we pride ourselves on as far as Black Lives Matter goes, right? We're making sure that we are keeping each other safe. Um, that's one of our core principles. Now, we all face adversity in our own lives. What are some moments of adversity in your own lives and how did you overcome them? I was arrested when I was 13, um, you know, and, and charged with assault and battery. And most of my freshman year of high school, I was either in a, in a jail cell or on house arrest. And I was blessed to be surrounded by folks who really poured into me love and resources and support. And I also saw, you know, coming out of that experience that so many of our kids, so many kids that I was locked up with at that age were not getting that same thing. Having had the blessing, the privilege to get out of that experience, to have gone through and, and to overcome that really also made me feel like a responsibility to advocate to change some of these systems. I lost a close friend of mine, Kenny Watkins, to police violence. He was shot in the back at the age of 18. And so I knew then that I had to do something. I had to support, right, first his family, but also think about, well, how do I prevent this from happening to someone else? It was a reality check for me, for sure. Um, and it was the way that I kind of came into this work. For me, when I think about adversity, it, it's not necessarily like tied to Black Lives, but it is. It's just growing up very, very poor like borrowing electricity from the neighbor is kind of mm -hmm. poor. Like just to make it to make it through that, you know, and like as a kid, that's tough. Yeah. It gave me a heart of empathy mm -hmm. for, for those that are less fortunate and to, to to be able to be in a position today to be able to help them and to be able to help people and to be able to provide resources to people. Um, it's just a huge blessing, I'm thankful. So thank you guys for sharing your story. I almost Man. got emotional there. It <laughs> took me back a little bit Absolutely. To, to those moments in my life. This was great. I see why 
Tanache had me come and speak to you guys um, because it's much bigger um, and there's bigger moments and uh, you guys are living those moments. So thank you, I appreciate it. You know, living a day in the life of someone, it's not as easy as I thought it would. Oh, message from Tanache. Hey Jack, it's me again. I just wanted to say thank you so much for going on this whole journey with me. I know that you've had a blast today. We got to really get inside my world and it was super, super fun for me and super special for me to see you. You know, try on the outfits, learn the choreography. You killed it. I think you really got a chance to embody everything that it means to be in my shoes. So thank you so much for having me. Bye. That, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Tanache. Living the day in the life of someone, we all have our expectations of what that might be. We see them on TV, we see them on movies, and we assume how easy their life is. But none of us really have it easy at the end of the day. We all have our own obstacles. We all have our own hurdles. We all have our own challenges that we must go through to be who we want to be and to get to being the best versions of ourselves. Today, that was Tanache showing me that it's not just about the stage, it's about the creativity, it's about living in the moment and being the best version of herself for not only the audience and the fans, but for her. Because that's what's important, being the best version of you for you. And that's really what this show is about. Digging deep, finding out their why, and finding out how they live their lives. This is Soul Swap with Jacques Slade. With us is the creator of Soul Swap, Jock Slade. He's a top YouTube host and the driving force behind some of the most entertaining content in the sneaker world. However, Jock is much more than sneakers alone, and he's here to tell us about it. Jock, thanks for joining us. Thank you guys for having me. Yes. Happy to be here. Yes, yes, so happy to have you. And I mean, I gotta just get straight into it with you. What was your motivation for creating Soul Swap? I think a lot of us see people like you and we don't exactly know what goes into you being who you are and becoming who you are. So Soul Swap was an idea. Uh, I'm into sneakers, so I you know, try to tie it to like walking in someone's shoes, but walking in your shoes for a day, because no one knows the work that goes on behind the scenes. They see you on TV, they see you on the internet, and they think, oh, they, they, they got a charmed life. They bless, God bless them, <laughs> God bless them. But they don't know like the work that it took for you to get there, for sure. what it takes to write a song, what it takes to act in a movie, the, the lines you gotta learn, all of those things. So I wanted to give them a glimpse of that world through Soul Swap. You work with Tanache. Yeah, yeah. Yo, what, is, what surprised you about her? One, just how aware she is of, like, of her creative energy. Like, I think that's part of it. Like, you have to, as a creative, you kind of kind of let your spirit go and be able to take risk. But then also, how much of the business side you have to learn mm -hmm. a, as an artist as well. And then she dancing and singing at the same time. Like, I, I ain't got that. Like, I, I think <laughs> about guys like, like Big Daddy Kane and yeah, Heavy D that on. were, like, dancing and oh, rapping yeah. Yeah. at MC the same Hammer. time. MC yeah. Hammer dancing <laughs> and rapping at the same time. Like, that's a gift. But I love that you say that about Tanache because she's a beautiful girl, and I think a lot of times people would just think, oh, she just moving it dance and she's up there, but oh, she's yeah. been working and uh, making her own tracks since she was like 15, yep. 16, yeah. producing her own stuff. So I know that was awesome for people to get a chance to really see, you know, that she's, there's tons of substance there. Yeah, tons of, and like she's thinking about the whole process. Oh, she's yeah. an independent artist now, so God bless her for that, you yeah. know, that yeah. black entrepreneurialism, but just yeah. being independent and then, you know, I have to, she has to worry about the choreography. She has to worry about the yeah. song. She has to worry about what the stage looks like. She has to worry about what she, yep. what she's wearing. She has to worry about what, how the lights are going to be, the song order that she has to put in. Yep. Like all of those things, like people don't realize like there's a whole process. And as the artist, she's putting all that together because that's her creative vision. So Soul yep. Swap yeah. is giving us the opportunity to kind of see behind the scenes for people like yeah. that. People around didn't know like once you, put out a record, they just think you made it. They think, yeah. yo, you got a video out. It's just easy and it's like, no, man, it's a, it's a lot of work that goes into this, but it's worth it and it's good mm -hmm. for us to get in each other's shoes to understand each other. I mean, that's one of the best ways of actually connecting with human beings is like to be able to symbolically walk in their shoes uh, if you can, you know? How do you think the experiences in Soul Swap can actually help others within the community? Hopefully it'll allow us to see, one, the hard work that these people do, but also recognize the work that we need to do in ourselves and use that as an opportunity to grow. You know, as people of color, they, often we, 
we feel like, one, you know, people see us that we made it, and they do. They kind of, they put a barrier yeah. like, oh, the, everything's good yeah. in your life, but we are human just yeah. the same. We're still like, on we the go, hamster wheel. Yeah, we're yeah. still on the hamster wheel. We still go through <laughs> yeah. heartbreak. We still work oh, yeah. hard. We still have doubts. Yeah. We still have joys. We have ups and we have downs. And like this, with this show, we'll be able to provide a light to that. Such an education in that, in like soul swap, yeah, man. Man. Yeah. Like, man, thank you so much sure, John, thank for you joining guys. us, man. Oh. It's been incredible to Absolutely. talk to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Appreciate you guys. Yes. Thank you. We communicate in so many ways. Some people do so through facial expressions, others through body language. Writers do so by what they put down on the paper, and musicians communicate through their words and songs. A conversation between comedian Teddy Ray, acclaimed musician Smino, and a phrase Smino used, what, say what, led to the creation of our next episode, which gives artists the opportunity to speak their minds, share their lyrics, and connect with their fans in their own way. Teddy Ray, this is my new show, What Say What. I'm so happy y'all tapped in with me, because uh, this is it, y'all. We in my mama garage. I, I know y'all like, what, what is he doing? Why is he in slides? Why is he so comfortable? Why is his toes spread? I'll tell you right now, this is the ambiance I wanted to lay out. Very comfortable, laid back. Some of my homies are some of the most talented people in the world, but you know, when they out there, they gonna get the, all the paparazzi. When they here, this is my mama house. Chill out, you feel me? Kick back, it's a vibe. I hope y'all settled in, got you something to snack on, because I'm about to take you on the journey. First, we're going to take a little stop over there to the dirt. Live from the blue, 314. I'm about to pick up one of my friends, one of the most talented artists in, in my lifetime, this generation, and we gonna have him spend a day with us to show him what his, what his hometown like. Man, cold in the evening, man. Oh, I thought that was your uncle behind you, boy. Oh, shit, man, what you doing to my shit, man? Hey, man, man, you know I gotta pop up. Come on, dirty. Where we at, bro? Chillin' in the fuck. Uh, Woo! Uh, hey. Woo! Look, I got an arch right there. Look how beautiful this shit is. Woo! Now, that's a real St. Louis picture. Some of the most... I would say important figures in American history. A good percentage of them come from St. Louis, just right here. From the Maya Angelou's to the Red Foxes. And Nelly, one of my biggest inspos. You feel me? I bought Nelly Bill. Yeah, everybody, he had the whole world shook, bro. Bro, I almost was like, he put on for the loose so hard, I was like, I need to move him. <laughs> it's always been crazy, that's the thing. Like, the city always been fire, it always be some cold shit to come out of it, but it's always crazy. It's the mecca, bro. Like, I call it Holy Land, it's Babylon. Like, a lot of the shit that starts off in the nation starts off in St. Louis, bro. I don't care who you is, bro. Like, my city is big old hood. Everybody went to church. Just the fact that this shit so ghetto, and to get calmed down, your grandparents and your mama and them make you stay in church. That shit affected everybody, bro. The rawest musicians came out that month. I'm a drummer, so sitting there being just on the high head, hearing people make harmonies behind me like the whole time. Y'all yeah, just grew up like, damn. I rap based off like, I got that vibe. You know what I'm saying? That's how I rap, so. That's beautiful. I can hear it in your music, too, because you got yeah. a lot of different tones that you choose to, to play with, and that don't come from just listening to one thing. My pops played me that Busta Rhymes woo ha for the first time. And then I remember seeing the video, and I was like, damn. He loved a whole lot of like jazz music and stuff like that, and he always put me on like Herbie Hancock, like Stevie Wonder. Wow. You know what I'm saying? All kind of cool shit. You know, crazy thing is, the real hip hop shit came in because my sisters, they love to live. And like, that exposed me to Timberland. Feel me? And like all the world are just crazy, just like crazy, you know what I'm saying? Crazy shit. And then my older sister, Lil Lil Wayne. Crib was really just a crazy, just slew of shit you were listening to. You would be listening to all kind of music, walking upstairs, past another person's room, downstairs. My mama, she playing that Yolanda. Man. Yolanda Adams. Every time. Had a loop going up. <laughs> That's My boy. My brother, what up, man? What's up with the player? Eddie Wright. I like that jacket, boy. Right on, 
I just What's can't... that, King James Leather? Men's Warehouse. Okay. And me. Hey, bro, they got the two for 100. Yeah. Back in the day, that was the only way I could buy suits. For real? They did that suit? No, nah, see, what had happened in this picture, this is my great, 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 great granddaddy that bought himself out of slavery. Damn. And so from his generational wealth that trickled down to us, we was able to get this crib in like two Buicks. Right. Yeah. Like they painted your granddaddy with barbecue sauce. With barbecue sauce? Yeah, they painted. Cause he was saucy, man. Oh. You got a fur coat? Just like you, man. Man, bro. I'm, First I'm happy off. To be here. I'm happy that you're here. I'm honored that you're here first off, bro, because okay. you really talented immensely. I don't think people understand what goes into making music, bro, but you pay attention to every detail. Appreciate that. And, I, and it shows in the music, bro. Appreciate that, bro. Who was your first inspiration? My big cousin, his name Heavy. Heavy? Yeah, Heavy, bro. He uh, uh he played the drums. Okay. And, Did uh, he play it heavy, his arm? <laughs> nah, they just called him Heavy because he be punching. But oh. um, I thought because he was built like me. <laughs> nah, my cousin Heavy used to play drums at church, and I'd be seeing him all the time. I'd be like, man, I want to play the drums. And then I uh, just start playing on stuff. My, my daddy bought me a, a drum set at home, and he heard me holding it down, so he, he was playing keys at the church. So he was like, let my son play. You man, like, yeah. might as well. Yeah, so I hopped and on. and I'm pretty gone. sure they, they taught you like they make a little money. Yeah. Get a little couple twos and fuse. Nah, for sure. Man, $20, $30? That shit different. You be making your own money when you like, you know, a kid. It be a little bit, but it was my first lesson in learning how to like, you know, be compensated for what I what I deserve, you feel me? Right, Straight you do up. the work, you get a reward. Yeah. It should okay. be like that. This ain't slavery no more. That's <laughs> what my granddaddy bought us out of. Well, he bought himself out of. I'm he like, didn't have man. enough money to put down on everybody freedom. Yeah. But you know, what goes into your creative process when you go into the lab, I know you say you a drummer. Yeah. So is that how you approach it? Like, all right, I need some, I need some percussion at the top. I mean, yeah, like that part cool, but it ain't even about that. Like, I just be natural. Like, whatever I feel, I won't know until I go. Like, I don't, I don't go somewhere. But I'm about to make a song like Yolanda Adams. You know what I'm saying? And go to the studio and be singing. I don't do that. I really just be trying to make a like a little vibe. I hate the word vibe. I try to create a little, curate a little energy before you I even get to. there. You know what I'm saying? So I pull up, hopefully it's like, you know, some nice little yerba or some, some, some type of caffeine in there, cause you know, I'll be high. I mean, okay. I'll be smoking my herbs. Herbal know, essence? Herbal essence, no real drugs. No, nah, don't do drugs, kids, yeah, just smoke weed. weed. But like, I go in there, you know, I might smoke my little weed, we won't, but I, I really like, and this might sound hella crazy, but I'm really hella inspired by shit that I did before. Did that make sense to you? Like. I listen to like old shit me and Monty might have made like years ago that might not have never came out. And I hear a flow that I did and be like, damn, like, I bet. All right, I'm ready to start working. So bro, what you be doing when you when you go out to be funny, man? You feel me? Bro, I, you know what's crazy? I get weird, bro. I like complete silence. Like stand up, I'm, I'm on stage by myself. So I kind of got to see the crowd, feel the crowd. I like to be, by, by, uh, be to myself yeah. when I create. And then maybe I'll, in conversation, try some jokes out on the homies. But I hate when people run jokes by me. So it's like, it's a way, I think that's why people be like, oh, you're natural, you're natural. Cause I be trying to find a way to just yeah. see if that works. You feel me? I feel it, I feel it. I, I tell you this all the time, man. I'm a big fan of your music, man. What can we expect from this third album? I just always like to make shit about real life. You feel me? So as long as I'm living, I'm always inspired. You feel me? That's how I feel. But that's a good game right there. In real time, this album, uh, it's called Love for Rent, you feel me? Okay. It's it's based, it's based on, you know, different types of love. It could be bad love, petty love, uh, obsessive love, just different. real good love, family love, but it's about just the different ways I lend it out my heart to the point where I ain't have enough left for myself, you feel me? Mm. And I was just like, okay, like, I put a pause on a bunch of shit, and I kind of like gave out all this love, and didn't think yeah, about self love. Yeah, cause like yeah, letting everybody come eat, and then you go get the plate last, and you like, damn, I'm hungry than a bitch. In real time, though, I just be trying to find the like best version of me to put out. You feel me? Mm. I could put out a million songs all day, but I feel like part of me being who I am is not being all uh, in people's face. You feel me? All the time, being kind of like selfish with my emotions and listening to shit, I make it for me. 
feel me? But once you write something down, it don't belong to you no more. You feel me? Like, it, you don't got to hold it. It's, it's on the universe. Paper. So I'm just like, saying when I put songs out, I'm putting out the shit that I feel like I don't want to hold on to. So I'm just like, that's the songs I release. You feel me? Like, y'all can have that emotion. You feel me? Now I'm moving on to another one. You feel me? So I'm all just that's what the whole, that's the whole synopsis of this album. What is love to you? Love to me is a uh, unconditional expression of being real to somebody. It ain't even about like nothing else but letting, like accepting people for who they is. Like you can love somebody if you just let them rock. You know mm. what I mean? Like I'll with you, we cool. You know what I'm saying? But uh, yeah, that's love. What's up with the performance today? What you what you got in tomorrow? Today, I'm gonna do a new song off my new album. Then I'm gonna do another song off the album that's coming out today. That all new stuff. Yeah, all new stuff today. Okay. Only new stuff. I'm coming to your mama house. I ain't gonna come over and do some. You know what I'm saying? Right, bro. Recycle but you know my mama like, like the hits. Yeah. No, I got she the hits. Needs, I be here. I be catching her in the kitchen. Say you real picky or lying, Mufasa. I be like, Mama, what you know about the homie? Mama ain't never sing a line, Mufasa. Hey, man, I'm excited, bro. Ladies and gentlemen, without no further ado, be Smino. My stove lit my blunt for me this morning. Ooh, don't get me started. I just spent my last bit of finances recording. Sinking in this icebox for my hardest. Roll a whole lot more, but young get so high you can't touch me. You can't touch me. Send a feed my speed, take time with the hate when I'm up and try to rush me. Oh, this bitch nasty. Roll a book, KD, on the rise, I've been on overdrive, trying to feel something. Lost my n***a in August and all I'm supposed to feel normal about it like now Fox you when you put it on the beside you Right for too long, your soul'll be gone Jamie Foxx in the cartoon, bro We send balloons to the sky for my new angel My kids like Friday, Craig. Run me my money today, day. Mike F2 steps on a payday. Peanut butter seats going nuts on the E-way. Baby, I ain't doing anything. You gon' feel it, feel it. Got a feeling like my teeth ache. I'm on sure no, don't get me started. I'm choking the bottle to hunt I might jump on somebody. So yeah, man, I hope y'all enjoying y'all self so far with this shit. I wrote that song, I deserve, basically like, you know, I was in the studio having this crazy ass writer block moment, you know, I'm feeling like, damn, I ain't made nothing I like in like weeks, so I was getting real like depressed and discouraged, because when I can't create, I start feeling real 
but um, I was just sitting in the studio listening to beats and I just started crying, bro, just about all that shit. I was real overwhelmed, you know what I'm saying? I ain't, I ain't the type of person that like to cry much in front of people, but I was just like, I heard something in my head that was like, you deserve this, like you deserve to cry right now, you deserve to feel everything that you feel times 10 if you got to, you feel me? So I, I was just like, damn, fuck it. Pull them cuffs up, I deserve it. You know what I'm saying? Run a checkup, I deserve it. I've been working, all I'm doing is working because I don't want to be thinking like I've been thinking. You feel me? Straight up, put that p on me, I deserve it. Shit, what I told my shorty. So, yeah, bro. I just was like, who's to say you don't deserve it, my is an amazing rapper and singer, a master wordsmith who combines hip-hop, funk, and soul in the music he creates. Teddy Ray is a comedian, actor, and internet star. And together, they created What Say What. Teddy, Smino, thank you guys so much for joining us. It's good to see you again, Teddy. Hey, you already yeah. know. We got history. Oh, I don't want me to put that out there like that. <laughs> I flirted with her at a comedy show. She was on a date. I didn't care nothing about that. Oh. I was flattered, I was flattered. Smino, you, know, you do a lot of performances, you meet a lot of people, interview. What was it about Teddy's vibe that made you say, okay, you know, I want to be a part of what you're doing with this? For real, bro, like, a, a real music fan, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'm a real comedy fan. Like, my favorite thing to, to do is watch black comedies, you feel yeah. me? I was just like, man, I miss when um, artists used to come something like and break down their songs like that, like, you know what I'm saying? I also felt like it wasn't no black 
show for uh, us to come break our music on. We need something for us, by us, that's gonna be like, I right, bet we gonna showcase our people, you feel yeah. me? Put them on this platform and let them break down their words. Yo, Teddy, uh, why'd you wanna do this project? What did you want the audience to get from this? I did this project first, to answer the first question, Smee came to me. Me and Smee, all we do is really talk about music, how it makes us feel where we was at when certain songs hit. And it was just like these conversations we was having, you know, I was this age when this song hit and that kind of changed the trajectory of my life. And so that's just kind of how the conversations we wanted to have with artists. You know, I think about music in that way too. Like, man, these certain songs affected my life. And I remember what it meant for my life. And I was like, man, what do the, what songs do the new generation have? Right. That, that, that where those songs really meant that to y'all. I love what you guys talk about in terms of, you know, on the show, what's the song that changed your life? And so, yeah. of course, I want to ask you, what would you say is that, that song that, that changed the tra trajectory of your life or that really impacted you growing up? Dang, I'm trying to think. My, my uh, mine, bro, I'm a rapper. I love rap, yeah. bro. So, like, uh, mine, mine straight Kanye, bro. Uh, mm. He got this song called I Wonder. Yeah. And that Ooh. song straight, yeah, that song just turned me all the way up when I was a little kid. Yeah. Either that or that spaceship by him. Uh, Smino, who's somebody in music that you would like to have a sit-down conversation with? Missy Elliott. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. Missy Elliott's the bomb. Teddy, as far as you, as far as your dream interview, who would that be? Bobby Brown. Wow. Because he's just, he's so legendary. Mm. And, like, he's just lived such an incredible life. I just feel like he's seen so much, he's done so much, and now he's selling barbecue sauce. Is he? Hold on, what? Yeah. <laughs> Bobby Brown got barbecue sauce, bro. Brown sugar, Bobby Brown sugar is Bobby Brown. Brown. <laughs> That would be a wonderful Bobby playoff Brown. word. Oh, yeah, yeah, Bobby Brown sugar. I'm getting everybody Bobby Brown barbecue sauce for Christmas. I'm letting y'all know that right now. Yeah, put me on, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Man, well, we thank you guys so much for joining us. Seriously, yeah. this is a great conversation. And anytime we can continuously dive into music and what it means to us and how it shaped who we are, it's mm -hmm. always a conversation I want to yeah. be part of. Super Zeros is a bit different from the Marvel and DC superhero films we all watch. And it began when YouTube host Evan Rayner came up with a question that's both fascinating and funny. The question is this. What if superheroes, instead of having x-ray vision or being able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, could have really annoying and seemingly useless powers? To help answer these questions, this creator, who was influenced by Dr. Seuss music, comedy, and fairy tales, worked with the artists at award-winning animation studio Lion Forge and the incomparable Sterling K. Brown to bring his vision to life. Let's take a look. In a place far away in a world much like ours, there was a great group of heroes with great superpowers. They protected the cities and towns from the beasts and the monsters and the goblins and any corrupted police. They could fly, shoot lasers, or change shapes at will. And the people of the city praised their combat skill. But that's not our world. And this isn't a story about that group of heroes who are surely destined for glory. This story is about a special group of heroes who are known across the galaxy as the Great Super Zeros. So allow me to introduce this unimpressive force. There was Hatface and Vegetable Man and Lightning Boots, of course. Jumper and Lady Wit and Boring Boy came next to round out a squad that was really a mess. See, they all had powers, though their powers were, well, kinda weak. As you could tell from passers-by if you overheard them speak. You heard about those lame Super Zeros last night? Yeah, I heard they didn't even know how to fight. Criminals took off and stole all the money. Aw, oh, now that's just sad. And it certainly wasn't funny. One reason our heroes were so unsuccessful was because they didn't know how to fight. And that made fighting stressful. Hatface had a hat for a face. Or was it a face for a hat? And if he took one off, it would be replaced just like that. And Vegetable Man? What to say about him? He could materialize vegetables at his earliest whim. Lightning Boots was fast. I mean, faster than fast. She could give a man whiplash as she ever dashed past. Her only real issue, and you would agree, was that when she ran that fast, she just couldn't see. Then there was Jumper, who could jump really high. He could jump all the way till his head hit the sky. Their leader, Lady Wit, was cunning and as cute as can be despite the fact that she stood only one foot three. And Boring Boy was boring. That's really all to say. 
When he talked, everyone thought that nap time was on its way. So the six of them stood vigilant over the places we all called home and tried to help the best they could to make our city safe to roam. Though try their best, despite the rest, they never could get things right. And that goes back to the simple fact that they never learned how to fight. And pretty soon the police stopped asking for help and the people stopped calling them too. The phone stopped ringing in their secret hideout and they didn't know what to do. Then Lady Wit stood up tall, barely taller than most their knees and said, Giving, my friends, is not about expecting to receive. We help because we can, because we know that we could. And it doesn't always have to end up how we think it should. Then out of the sky, before the others could respond, came a whoosh and a thud and an ow on the lawn. They ran outside to see what it was. It was a 30-foot monster with yellow peach fuzz. The monster had spikes on his head made of bone and his teeth shone in the sunlight like precious stones. They were red like rubies and his eyes were like ice. It was pretty safe to say that this monster was not nice. The six heroes were stunned, but they leapt into action as the monster yelled, wait, in a timely reaction. The heroes all stopped in their tracks and said, what? The monster took a look at them and sat on his butt. Are you the six superheroes on this world they call Earth? The ones who have almost zero super worth? I've heard about you on my planet called Rawr. The entire galaxy knows who you are. The heroes stood silent, ready as ever, to fight this mean monster who thought he was clever. I've got another planet to conquer by dinner, so why don't you just hop in my mouth and call me the winner? Not even your own planet wants your help. They'd rather see their homes crumble, see their people scream and yelp. The hero stood still. Then Lady Wit said, hat face, go. So he ripped the cap off his head. Made in medieval times, it was a pointed metal hat. He threw it at the monster, but the monster caught it and threw the hat back. Jumper went next and gave Lady Wit a wink. Then he jumped into the sky and disappeared in a blink. But where six heroes once stood, now only five could be seen because Jumper wouldn't come down until 4.15. Lightning Boots had an issue, confess it I must. Whenever she ran, she kicked up too much dust. She did everything she could so the monster would flee, but with dust in her eyes, she ran straight into a tree. Not just any little tree, a large oak at that. And she ran right through it, turned around and ran back. The monster became so dizzy watching Lightning Boots run free that he completely missed Lightning Boots charging towards his knee. Then came the impact with a loud boom and a crack, and the monster toppled over and fell on his back. Writhing in pain and shock and surprise, the monster shrieked, aren't you supposed to be those lame super guys? But without a reply came the great vegetable man, who could materialize vegetables into the palm of his hand. And he gathered a few and threw them out right down into the big monster's big mouth. And oh, what a scream, what a shout, what a holler. Because his least favorite thing in the galaxy was cauliflower. Go back, said Lady Wit. We've beaten you fair. But the monster just laughed and stood up without a care. The monster said, really? Come on, guys, that's the end. That guy jumped really high, and now what, you win? Nice try, said the monster in a curious tone. I'm the biggest, baddest monster this city's ever known. Not true, said Lady Wit. I saw another who last spring bought a nice birthday gift for his mother. Now he was a monster, big and nice. Unlike you, you all beans, no rice. All beans, no rice? All beans, no rice? The monster repeated not once, but twice. You know what, little girl? I am beans and rice, and tortillas, and lettuce, and tomatoes, and spice. But I don't have it all. No, my meal's not complete until you and your friends are my hamburger meat. It all happened so fast. The monster lurched out with a hand that could grab a whole building, no doubt. Right at Lady Wit, it was a gruesome thing. No one should be eaten at 4.15. 4.15, wait, it was 4.15. Then came a noise from the sky like a scream. Then a rocket came flying straight down on the city. The monster looked up and said, this doesn't look pretty. But before he could run in what seemed like a flash, right on the top of the monster's head, the thing crashed. But it wasn't a rocket 
or a nuclear blast? It was Jumper, the Super Zero, who had landed at last. Now that's beans and rice, said Lady Wit. Sometimes you never know what powers you'll get, but when you use what you got and you use it for good, then the world will be better because you've understood that whether you're small, stout, or thin, the real power of heroes comes from within. The monster lay dazed, but then he opened his eyes to whisper a few words to the zeros, which caught them by surprise. Why would you protect a silly planet that doesn't understand who you are? Truth is, you're the strongest superheroes I've faced so far. He waited for the blow that would end it all, but the heroes just stood there, proud and tall. Then, Boring Boy walked slowly into the action, which for most boring people is a normal reaction. He told boring stories of his most boring day to keep the mean monster sleeping while they locked him away. The monster lay defeated, unconscious on the ground, and the Super Zeros were celebrated for protecting the town. We may never have powers like fire or ice or something useful in combat to make villains think twice. We might be short or jump incalculable heights, wear weird hats, and get our vegetables reasonably priced. But the powers we have Disadvantages in all are enough to be a hero, no matter how small. There's a whole world of people who don't fit into a mold if they never embrace that and just do what they're told. One day they'll regret it. And having grown old, say, I wish I showed the world all the power I hold. What a humongous, ginormous, whopping waste it would be if you didn't do the great things you could do or see the great places you could see. Every road is hard, but it's especially tough when the people at the top say you'll never be good enough. What the Zeros found out is how to change the playing field, how to build their own future that loves the powers they yield. And this story of the Zeros, though small on that day, carried weight across the galaxy to places far, far away. It brought hope to so many who didn't fit in that a team of misfits, of people just like them, weren't the butt of a joke, no second choice on a whim, but the galaxy's best heroes and zeros till the end. Evan Rayner's popular Rain Day gaming show allowed him, the audience, and platform to create works outside of his comfort zone and that of his viewers. Evan, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. I can't wait to get into this with you. So glad to be here. You went from music to gaming. Yep. How did you get to being an animator? I started writing books in rhyme um, with inspirational kind of children's books elements, and, and they kind of sat there. And I would, I would perform them. Nothing happened. And uh, eventually, life happened. We ended up having some, some struggles in the 2008, 2009 crash. I was babysitting, doing anything to stay around. And I was like, how can I build a business like to get my stuff out there. And, and I thought, you know, YouTube is really a platform with like an infinite ceiling, you know? And no one needs to know who you were or where you came from, as long as you put out good stuff. So for me, that was like, that's the inspiration I needed. So I was like, once I build this, I've always been a fan of gaming, um, then I can do all my other stuff. And so it's kind of funny how 10 years later, after building the gaming channel, uh, YouTube reaches out, hey, do you have anything? We're doing this series. And I, I just, I threw them this book on a whim. They were like, hey, let's talk tomorrow. And so you created this film with YouTube. Yeah, so I wrote it. It was a children's book. It is a children's book. Yeah. And YouTube said, we want it. We want to animate it. And so they beat me to the actual book. I haven't even published the book yet. <laughs> uh, but um, it was so cool. And then, and then Sterling got attached, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to narrate it. Um, and he brought everything that he does, which is just phenomenal. It took it up another notch. So that's amazing. Uh, it so was just surreal. When you wrote the book, yeah. you know, what was your goal? What kind of, you know, created that for you? I've always been a fan of how simplicity. And I think, you know, when you, when, you know, as a music fan, it's like sometimes the rhymes that are simple really relate to the most people. And mm -hmm. they, they have the biggest impact because you can put your own story on them. They're not so complicated that you have to think of someone else. You can apply it to your life. So I've always thought children's books and, and fairy tales have yes. this weird, interesting way of for parents reading them and the kids 
to teach these big things yes. that matter in life yeah. without being too complicated. Yes. If I can encourage that dynamic to take place and then use my imagination, that's the impact I want to make on the world, right? Yeah. And God so I feel like that was that was really the, the the reason I started doing it. We talk about super zero powers, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Talk, what, what would be the super zero power that you would have? For me, honesty. I feel like you could just have this level of honesty that breaks somebody down and that tends to be who I am I'm honest almost to a fault oh so where God. people are like dang like you know my you know my my parents that. maybe didn't love me I, I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> now that you think about it I, you know and I think that would like throw a villain off like dang you know cuts to the cord so I think that would be a fun one for me I love that yeah I love that <laughs> honesty I love that yeah. that's great right. so what was the message that you wanted uh, people to take away from you know um, Super zeros. I, that's a it's a great question. I, I think to me it, it's about if people can understand that the the power in their life lies within them. Oh. Mm -hmm. They can understand that everything that they need isn't outside; it's inside, and and they champion that and really just work to say, let me be the best version of myself. I think that's. And in my experience in my life, you know, I didn't come from crazy financial security, but I had a lot of inner self-security. Mm. And I feel like that is a lesson from parents to pass to kids, and I think from kids to grow up with, means that no matter what situation you go in, you always feel secure, like, you know, you're powerful. Man, that would be very powerful. Like, oh, man, that is, that's we amazing. need that. I we appreciate need that. it, man. And how, how like, how would you like to see change in the community? I've always thought about this in a big way because I'm very focused on, on impacting people in a big, big way in society and whatever I can. Sometimes we have these big focuses, but we don't touch any of those big elements because we're like, well, when I'm rich and famous, I can have an impact. It's like, yeah. you can have an impact right now, every day. Yes. Come on, yeah. Black Panther. Come on now. Yes, Come on I, now. I really <laughs> thank you so much, Evan. Thank Everything you, you said was yeah. so inspired. We thank appreciate you, you yeah. for joining us. Yeah, thank, thank you, you yeah. for joining us, man. Appreciate it, man. Well. That wraps up Bear Witness Take Action 3. Meeting these amazing creators, being able to share their work and experiencing their passion was such a joy. And it's been so much fun for us to take this program to the next level and showcase these creators. And we're so proud that they're using their voices to bring relevant issues to the forefront and inspire needed change. Yes, thank you guys for joining us. And don't forget to take action by supporting these remarkable creators and storytellers on social media and subscribing to their YouTube channels. Peace.